you're going to find it. Come back to kill. A force so deadly, it will... of a bloody joke. <laughs> Who the fuck is there? Jane? Thank you, Mona. Roger, in a situation like this with the possibility of a mad killer roaming our city, even the slightest suspicion should be reported to the police. I couldn't agree with you more, Jane. We've got a psychopath running around out there. Every woman should report anything unusual, any odd encounter or situation. This is a crazy question, but can a cuckoo clock make music? Or does it just go cuckoo? I really blew it at work yesterday. This rapist thing is really getting to me. When you spoke with her, did she seem upset? Yeah, she was upset, but I don't think that she ever believed that she was in any immediate danger. I mean, we all get calls like that at one time or another. You're gonna get yourself hurt. I got that shoe to convince you. This is Jane Harris reporting. Back to you, Roger. That was a terrific report, Jane. Is yeah, there anything has else to be our viewers before can do? Before this phone freak strikes again. Before this phone freak strikes again. Before this phone freak strikes. This is Jane Harris reporting. This is Jane Harris reporting. Hello, this is PJ Souls from Halloween and Innocent Prey and Carrie and totally a lot of other movies. And you are listening to the Hysteria Continues. And indeed you are. Welcome back to The Hysteria Continues. This is episode 196 and we're heading very, very quickly towards the big 200. But before we get there, we're heading back to 1981, the hallowed year for the slasher movie, with a perhaps not best remembered or maybe not one of the uh, the big guns of 1981, but a film that I thought we should get around to reviewing at some point is Eyes of a Stranger um, with, uh, well, we'll get into that uh, shortly. That's our feature presentation, but we're very happy and, uh, you know, excited to be joined by a friend of the show, uh, Meep, a.k.a. Michael Ferrari from the Retro Movie Love podcast. Uh, Meep, how are you doing? Good, thank you. It's great to be on the show and uh, to hang out with you guys and talk slasher movies. Fantastic. What was the last time, what was the last one you were on with us for? It was, I looked, when I looked at the Skype um, thing, it said we hadn't spoken for about a year, so I can't remember what it was. I can't remember now. I know we talked Friday 13th movies, we did Final Exam, uh, so it's, it's been quite a while. Okay, right. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing your uh, thoughts on that. But we're also joined, as ever, by uh, fellow co-host, um, Eric. How are you doing over in Ireland? I'm doing good. I want my name to be Eric Porsche. So I can be cool like Michael Ferrari. <laughs> well, why not? Um, well, yes, that could, we, could or Eric Fiat. Eric Fiat. What? Um, yeah. Not Eric Dump Truck. Oh, That's a Heather's reference. Down. No. What was? What would your no. car be, Nathan? My my car. Well, if you could be, if you could change your last name to a car to be uh, sleek and sexy um, like Eric and Meep. Yeah. Okay. If I could change my last name to a car, it would be Christine. Okay. <laughs> Nathan <count>? Christine. <laughs> okay, right. Well, <laughs> um, Joseph, how about you? None of us expected that one. No, no. <laughs> what would your car be, Joseph? Hmm, probably something like Joseph, uh, I don't know. Uh, Lamborghini. Toyota. 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 I, I should have been Toya Toyota. <laughs> yeah, because I drive, I drive a lot of Toyotas because I, I do like the, uh, the, the Japanese cars are the best. So... Well, I'm just well, trying to you, think of some... What about you, Nate? <laughs> Justin? Uh, I think it would be a horse. Not a horse, a hearse. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Justin <laughs> Hearse. Well. Yeah, you, of all people, would not be driving a horse. No, yeah. I wouldn't be driving a horse. I don't know where that came from. But I anyway. Said whor- I thought you said whores. Whores, well. <laughs> <laughs> well, he would be dri- drive them crazy. Well, it's it's all it's all going to... It's going to be one of those shows, isn't it? We've already had to switch from Skype, which is being... Uh, 
the um, the C word, which we won't mention. But uh, so hopefully Discord will be kinder to us uh, tonight. But yeah, we're excited. Well, it, it's going to be interesting to uh, to chat about this film because it's a film that uh, Eric reminded me I gave a one star review on Hysteria Lives, and last time mm. we covered Don't Answer the Phone, which is another film which I didn't remember liking very much. So I think it's sometimes quite good to challenge yourselves um, listening or watching stuff that you remember not liking. It's like when I listened to that last Toyer album. Um, oh, but, of course you had to bring that into it. Of course, of course. You can't you can't resist. Well, it's been, uh, well, how many years have we been doing this now? This same shtick? Eight and a half. Blimey. Who knows? Uh, when, we get to, when we get to the 10th anniversary, we have to pick, up, pick some new singers like uh, Billie Eilish versus, I don't know, who's new and current? Um, Lewis Capaldi. Right. Well, uh, before we get on to the feature presentation, uh, let's have a quick chat about what we've been watching recently. And as guest of honour, Meep, have you got been watching anything you'd like to tell us about? I've been doing uh, a lot of different things for the podcast. I recently wrapped a Stephen King podcast for Patreon, and this is for the Retro Movie Love podcast, which I host, and been doing that for since 2014. And so we got into Stephen King territory, and so we watched tons of Stephen King movies, and and of course, um, movies like Carrie and Christine are among my favorites. And uh, and then I I went a little bit off the beaten track. I, I watched rewatched movies like. Um, a lot of the miniseries that he did. And I realized I don't like a lot of those, a lot of those adaptations into miniseries, but uh, there was one in particular that I enjoyed and that was uh, Rose Red from I think 2002, somewhere around there. And uh, I was pretty entertained by that one. It was like his take on the haunting of Hill House and, uh, and it kind of goes off in its own little Stephen King way. And uh, it, it's dated, of course, uh, has those early 2000s uh, bad CGI and effects, but I can look past those things. And I, there was a relatively engaging uh, movie as a miniseries format, which I generally don't like because I like, I like a good 90 minute or less uh, horror movie. Hence why I'm talking about Eyes of a Stranger. Uh, I'm not big on these six-hour miniseries or even these uh, new uh, new shows on Netflix and so on that are like six, eight, eight hours of of one thing. I just get kind of bored. But um, yeah, I enjoyed that one. And then I, uh, I've been doing ghost movies for the next podcast. So getting to a lot of ghosty movies, which are, which are fun. Um, more recently, um, I watched Haunt. Um, did anyone else see that one? Yeah, I think we all did. Yeah, yeah, I think so. See, I think I watched it because I, once it was over, I kind of forgot it. <laughs> Almost completely forgot it. It was enjoyable enough while watching it, but it's one of those movies that once it's over, it's, you just kind of, that was kind of a bummer. I thought I was, my expectations were a little bit higher. I liked Hellfest a lot from, uh, from uh, the last, uh, last year. And, uh, and that movie wasn't quite a great or a classic, but it was enjoyable. And I think this one was enjoyable, but then I just kind of, it kind of lost me a little bit. And I just kind of tuned out. I also watched uh, Satanic Panic, um, so I was not a fan of Satanic Panic, but I'm sure it does have its fans. I would call it hipster horror. Uh, just not for me. It just did not uh, click with me. Uh, two more. Um, it Chapter 2. I went to see that in the theater. I was kind of so-so on It Chapter 1. So I was kind of going into 2, expecting a bit more of the same with It Chapter 1, and it is that... But I feel like it's a bit of an improvement, too, on uh, the things that didn't work in Chapter 1. Um, so I, I en- ended up enjoying It Chapter 2 more. problem with It Chapter 2 is some of the casting of the actors uh, who play the grown-up versions of uh, The Losers Club. And I was kind of disappointed by some of them. I really think that... Um, for the most part, I thought, like, uh, especially the, the actress Jessica Chastain, who we usually like, really didn't capture uh, Beverly in the way I imagined, of course, her in, uh, uh, to be in this uh, grown-up version. I really like uh, the uh, the character in the book. I think she's a very integral to the book and even the miniseries. Uh, I think uh, I had a lot of fun with the miniseries, but the movies just not quite, they don't quite measure up to the to the book and the miniseries for me. So, so the, the miniseries is one of those things, uh, the exception to my rule, I actually did enjoy um, the three hours-ness of it. And I, I actually am always engaged with that movie. So maybe that's part of why I can't enjoy the new one as much. How about you guys? 
Well, should we? T- there's, a, there's a lot there, Meep, and thank you. I th- think um, uh, I think we've all seen Haunt. I haven't seen it, Chapter Two, yet. Because uh, neither have I. Yeah, that three-hour running time was turning me away. <clears throat> I'll watch it at home. I think. Mm. What about you? It didn't feel. It didn't quite feel like three hours, which I th- was pretty a testament to the film. It does move along fairly quickly, so that's if that's any incentive. Mm. I mean, I'll definitely watch it, it, but it's um, I, it's on at the cinema here at the moment, but it's in Spanish, so I think I'll wait to see if they uh, if they they, they pick uh, it as one of the movies they do in English once a week. But um, Nathan and Joseph, have you seen It Chapter Two or any any desire to? I haven't even seen It Chapter One. I don't really care to either. I'm just. Uh... Well, I've seen both of them. Okay. Um, I preferred the first one for these new ones. And actually, the miniseries, I was the same way. I preferred the first one. Mm -hmm. I just find all the stuff with the kids facing the monster to be a lot more terrifying than when they come back as adults. I mean, it was still good, and and I still enjoyed it. But um, I don't know. (sighs) That heavy overuse of CGI kind of bothered me a little. And I'm not one of these people that's anti-CGI and and, and horror altogether, but – Sometimes I feel like it's relied on maybe a little too much, and um, I just didn't find the second one to be quite as frightening as the first one. But I still liked it. Overall, I still enjoyed both. But to me, um, out of everything it related, the nothing can really beat the first part of the 90s miniseries. With those kids and Tim Curry as Pennywise. Yeah, he's really good in that. What I love about the miniseries is the first part of it feels like, to me, uh, Stand By Me is the big chill. So I kind of get like a two for one with that, with the, with the, with the original 1990 miniseries. Uh-huh. This one doesn't, they, they don't quite click the the, the cast in, the, in part two. So, so. This is going to shock you, me. I have never seen the big chill. <gasps> I know. It seems like something I would totally watch because I love 80s. Like, I love 80s uh, dramas, comedies, horror. I love everything 80s. So I can't believe it. Not science fiction. You don't. Well, yeah, that's true. Sci-fi and Silent Rage. Really my big thing. <laughs> yeah, Silent Rage is not at the top of your list, Nathan, is it? Well, it, it's not at the very bottom. It's just close to the bottom. Hmm. One more title before I uh, before I forget. I just watched it uh, over the last two nights. Midsummer. Okay. Hmm. Yes. The, I watched the director's cut. This is my first time watching this film. I skipped it in theaters. Uh, I just found it a little too daunting. I liked Hereditary, but felt it was a bit didn't really click for me. I think the first part of uh, Hereditary is a great film, and then a major character dies, and I when that happens, I kind of tune out and I just kind of I lost it a little bit. Uh, but with Midsummer, I don't know. It really worked for me watching it over two nights. It, I felt like it was kind of doing something to me. Like it was kind of putting me in this weird mindset and I really like what it was going for. And it, uh, um, I think it's a kind of movie you, you can't really explain or talk about too much. I think you kind of have to experience it. And this is a movie that I was really ready to not like. And I really ended up really liking it. And, I just, I just said my review is really just go out, watch it, review, uh, and just uh, experience it, and wail along with the characters. Okay. I think I'd have to do like you, uh-huh. me. I think I, for that movie, when I looked at the runtime, I'm like, if I break it up into two nights, I think yeah. I would enjoy it more than trying to watch it. I mean, I don't know what it is. I don't know if my attention span is just the size of an ant, but I just, I cannot do like these like really two and a half to three hour movies. Like I, I want to break them up. It works for breaking up this one because there, there are things that happen later in the film. So you might uh, have all the build up of the first part and then the second part, the payoff. Yeah. I'm not even, inter- even interested in breaking up this movie. I just, it, I have no interest in these dark kind of dour, uh, just kind of, I think they're going to go for like a quasi realism in these kind of fantastical storylines, but I don't know. I just, the older I get, I just, I, I can't get into stuff like that. I have to have like the, like Eric always says, I have to have the popcorn stuff. I mean, it's, it's mm-hmm. pretty much all I'm like wanting now is like the, the 80 to 90 minutes. So that, that runtime and that, and the, the aesthetic behind that film just well, kind of really puts me off. I can understand what you're saying there. And this is something I actually wanted to ask me as well, since, you know, he's seen it and all, but um, where I was classify hereditary as a depressing horror film, because it is a sad movie and it's very depressing to watch. Would you say Midsummer is the same way? Is it a depressing horror film? 
I actually don't think it's depressing in that sense. I think it's about a person, a person dealing with depression and kind of the places it goes. It starts off with a tragedy, um, whereas like hereditary kind of ends with like uh, there's, it's a tragedy and then it ends with they're in a really crazy place. This one kind of starts off with a tragedy and goes to some really outlandish and crazy weird places. Um, and you know, there's definitely echoes of movies like The Wicker Band and. There's some fantastical, oh. possibly fantastical stuff in it, or not. It's a, it's, it's, it's a kind of movie that I think I was ready to, like I said, ready not to like, but it really did something to me, and I really enjoyed it. And it's beautifully shot, of course, and all that, all that fun stuff. I think it's a, Ari Aster, so if not, he's a great director of, of atmosphere, and he really builds uh, this interesting world and, uh, and with music and performers that uh, are not are quite unusual. So. That's awesome because um, I'm also a big fan of The Wicker Man, or the, the original. I mean, I do love the remake, but for all the wrong reasons, not the bees. The bees. <laughs> well, let's, because um, there's quite a lot we've covered. Shall we um, just go back to Haunt for a minute? Because I think we've all seen oh, yeah. it. So, uh, yep. uh, Nathan, what did you think of Haunt? I loved Haunt. I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, I also really loved Hellfest. Um, I probably loved both of them about equally. Although I will say I think I prefer Hellfest's, Hellfest's can't even say it ending um i loved absolutely loved the way they ended hellfest i thought it was so amazing but haunt no haunt is great um i thought that um the kills were fun the cast was fun i mean it, it to me it's just you know and it's just an overall fun movie um i just had a lot of fun with it i can't really think of any other way to describe it um i didn't find it particularly scary but i did think it was you know uh entertaining so I recommend it. Cool. What about you, Eric? Yeah, I really liked it too. And it's, as everyone said, it's very, very similar to Hellfest, which was last year or two years ago. And what surprised me about the film was that it's been touted. Is, is it from the writers of A Quiet Place? Is that the what the blurb is accompanying it? Because um, I was expecting maybe something less linear because the film is very paint by numbers plot wise, which isn't a, a complaint for me. I like I like my sort of, um, you know, uh, cookie gutter horror films, which this very much is. I was just was surprised that there was no surprise twists or anything like that within the narrative. Having said that, I mean, it is it's enjoyable. But like Meep said, once it was over, I kind of forgot most of what I just watched. Um, I do recall having a conversation with Joseph about, well, let's just say a, a bad guy's unmasked maybe halfway through the film. And I was glad they took sort of a path A rather than path B. That's all I'll say. But um, yeah, um, a good, solid uh, popcorn movie. Fun. Uh, sounds like the antithesis. I can, I can barely say that word of um, Midsummer by the sounds of things. But uh, I enjoyed it. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you, Eric. What about you, Joseph? Yeah, I enjoyed the first half uh, more than I did the second. Uh, I think the film starts with like this kind of likable group of people, and uh, I, I like that they kind of they stumble upon one of those extreme kind of haunted attractions. And when they get in there, it kind of feels more like just kind of silly. Like they have like all these like just standard haunted house props, kind of like poking out of the walls and stuff like that. But then the building just slowly starts to kind of resemble the bathroom from Saw. And I think that's where I kind of, I, I think I lose a little interest because it, I don't know, some of the, some of the kind of Eli Rothisms kick into gear. He produced this, I should mention. And it just it starts to feel more like a, uh, kind of a slashery version of Hostel, you know, kind of dour and grimy and not, really as light and bounty as i wanted um that's not really a bad thing if it's done well and i, I guess it sort of is here but i don't know it's just uh i just I, I think it feels more like a you know like a silly slipknot video than it does anything scary or anything lasting um uh, once it was over like you said i just kind of forgot about it um so you know like a marginal recommendation but you know for like uh sort of those fun haunted house slasher thrills i still prefer uh, the dark ride from I, like a decade or so back from uh, whatever that that movie thing was that they did well, for, for the movie theater chains eight eight movies to die for or something that was it? It. Yeah, yeah yeah that's it I, I think I still prefer that one that's my uh, you know haunted house or you know postmodern slasher of choice cool okay well thank you I um I actually are probably more along the lines of uh, siding with Nathan on this I actually really enjoyed it and the, the, the hostile isms of the second half didn't bother me or because I I used to really I at the time it like was it 10 years ago sort of just over 10 years ago and all the kind of the films like train and and all the million hostile rip-offs that you saw that the whole inverted commas torture porn thing I found quite depressing but I thought it was done well here and I did um 
I, I I liked the popcorn feel of the first half, but I thought actually the payoff with a slightly dark, darker second half has actually kind of it it, it kind of earned it. Um, so it didn't annoy me as much as it might have done. Um, I also liked the, uh, the the twist. It was kind of a twist of actually when you find out who the killers are and what they you know, when they kind of the old um, thing about some monsters are real, you know, this kind of this idea that, uh, you know, these killers are um, are kind of living their dream, as it were, I thought was, uh, you know, quite interesting. But, um, but uh, the other, it seems that like Fright Fest, it's a Fright Fest, um, Hellfest and all these other movies like The Haunt, there's, there's more coming out, isn't there? I did see uh, the Alone in the Dark Essentials Talk and Slash, which is the um, upcoming, or the website for, or the Facebook group, the upcoming uh, Slasher Movie Compendium. Um, it's mentioning those two new movies. One's called Candy Corn, uh, which um, it looks like a slasher set of a fun fair, and another one, uh, Trick, which is uh, Patrick Lucier, who did um, the My Bloody Valentine remake, amongst other things. Uh, and it looks like that could be be again uh, along the same kind of line so it seems very much uh, 2019 uh, is uh, 2018 2019 are the years of the um uh, of the um uh, fun fair set slasher movie so yeah you know, well i'd say slasher movies in general i mean they're just popping up everywhere mm. well especially very in vogue right now well, I kind of guess the the box office Halloween didn't hurt, did it? And also Happy no. Death Day and various uh, those kind of movies, which it kind of goes back, doesn't it? People forget, but of course, slasher movies um, have always made, uh, usually not always, but often made uh, a good return on a relatively small budget. Uh, so it has a built an audience. They, they just feel sort of like prestigious now. It's like everyone's talking about them. Everyone wants to be in one, or they're just they're trying to. I, I guess they're trying to elevate them, you know, above the level that they've been on. And I don't necessarily want them to do that, but I kind of like the idea that someone, you know, just wants to take it to another level, I guess. Uh, That makes any sense. Yeah. Well, we'll find out a little bit later what uh, Jennifer Jason Lee thought about the uh, eyes of a stranger. (laughs) So (laughs) when you're talking about everyone wanting to be in a slash movie these days, Will. Don't you mean Jennifer Jason Keller? Oh, oh, uh, Eric, (laughs) is that your joke of the week? No, I've got even a better joke for the joke of the week. I do hope so. So, well, um, I've kind of lost my train of thought. I think we've we've just um, uh, finished with you, Meep. If we've if we finished, so you've seen a, an awful lot of things, which is which is fantastic because quite often uh, we sometimes we struggle because we're so busy. We haven't seen very much, so it's fantastic to to get to discuss all these things. But uh, Eric. Uh, have you seen anything you want to? Talk yes, about? I've seen a few things because, mm. of course, I was missing in action for the last uh, episode. Yes. Uh, I was pre recorded in a hilarious jape. <laughs> um, so I've seen a couple of things that you guys mentioned on the last podcast. So I'll just briefly go through those. Ma, I saw, or Ma from 2019 earlier this year. Um, I really liked it and I was surprised. I felt such sympathy for the title character. I mean, I, I, I was kind of teary-eyed at the end of the film. Um, I think it's brilliantly played by Octavia Spencer and it has that kind of carry effect on me, to be honest. I, I really sympathise with her plight. I mean, I know what she's doing is evil and the you know the kids are, are likeable enough in it, but uh, I couldn't help but side with her, I'm afraid. I don't know if anyone else felt that way about Ma. I did. No. Yeah. Yeah, I did too. I, I, I really liked her. Time. Yeah. I felt so bad for her. Especially in those flashbacks are heartbreaking, really. I mean, so it works kind of I like much better as a kind of a twisted drama than you know, the, the horror content is quite weak in it. But um, the other one I saw, and I was I had no intention of seeing this until Justin mentioned to me that uh, John Travolta's opening line in this film is, I can't talk right now, I need to do a big poo. <laughs> um, so this is The Fanatic, of course, with John Travolta and Devin yes. Sawa. So... Um, yes, that opening line sold it for me, uh, you know, and well, you know, more often than not, if you're going to put a well-known actor into the role of a character with, with sort of learning difficulties, it's it's going to be off-putting. And, you know, unfortunately, John Travolta is a great actor, but in this role, I don't know if it's the fact that we know him so well, that we know it's an actor, whatever, but I just, I just find him kind of laughable in the film. Having said that, by the end of the film, again, I was feeling sympathy for him. I felt kind of sad in that, those closing scenes for the character of Moose. Uh, and again, this has little horror content, really. It, it is more of a, a, I suppose, a drama with some unintentional comedy, sadly. But uh, I was entertained by it for its 90 minutes. I can see completely why it's, it bombed at the box office. 
um, because you know it's it's not a, it's not a classic. It's not an Oscar winning classic, unfortunately. Um, but I I did enjoy it, and of course any film with J- uh, John Travolta saying he needs he needs to go away and do a poo uh, it has to be worth watching. <laughs> any movie with I, John Travolta as Jason Voorhees is worth checking. Out. Uh, yes, yes, he dresses up as Jason Voorhees in one scene. I can't get past the scene with Devin Sawa and his son's like, oh, this is Limp Biscuit. Don't love Limp Biscuit. I'm like, oh my God. I just love, <laughs> love to just reach through the screen and just strangle Fred Durst just for that scene alone. Oh my God. Yes. But the movie um, itself, the movie itself is wildly, wildly entertaining. And I think for the wrong reasons for me personally. But yeah, yeah. Well, I would agree. Um, and like the, they could have done what making the Devin Sawa character a bit more sympathetic, I think. Uh, yeah, he seemed like a jerk almost. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, the other one I've seen, I know you've seen this one as well, Joseph. The only other one I've seen really is the 2019 reboot remake of Child's Play. So yes. I had I had kind of high hopes for this one as it, the, the reviews were really positive for it when it opened in cinemas here earlier in the year. Um, so I was kind I was I mean I was I found it entertaining, but I was a little bit disappointed. Um, in this version, Chucky's not possessed by the soul of a serial killer. Instead, we we see at the in the opening scene a disgruntled toy factory employee disable his inhibitor functions, um, which makes you know which makes the doll kind of stutter and malfunction, and so he's returned by the original purchaser, which is where our um, you know the mother in this version gets this Chucky doll, and so he learns through observation. So he sees Andy, his owner, give out about the family cat, for instance, and he sees this as okay to please my owner, I must kill the cat. And also he watches Andy and his friends sitting around watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre too, which uh, is probably please Nathan. And he sees the friends all laughing at the the over the top violence in Texas Chainsaw Two, and he thinks, okay, this must be acceptable. I, I can go around chainsawing people. So there are a couple of good, good kill scenes in it. One in particular involves Involving um, the janitor for the apartment block that they live in, who meets a very sticky end in a very graphic scene. I thought that was, but that bit was good. But for me, um, the, the fact that Chucky is now kind of a robot uh, means he lacks personality. I, I didn't really like the kid playing Andy either. I thought some of his acting was a bit off in certain scenes, and um, I didn't find that interesting. And the film ends up kind of with a gang of kids, not unlike in something like Stranger Things or It. Uh, where they're all ganging up trying to, you know, dispose of Chucky. But overall, I thought it was entertaining enough. I thought it was a bit flat and not as good as I was hoping for, but I think it's worth a watch. I know that you, Joseph, liked it a lot more. Yeah, I I liked the film a lot. Um, I did like the, the the reason for the the, the Chucky doll to exist. It's, it's it's technically just like The Simpsons. Like someone flipped the switch to off, like his evil switch. It is. I thought that it's was like hilarious. I saw that. Zone. I was like, oh my god, that was so ridiculous. But I, I I like how this film just completely tells its own story. You know, rather than rehashing the original. Um, if it has a failing and maybe it has a couple, uh, you kind of miss that sort of, uh, the, the heroic kind of parental element that made the original films, this sort of kind of close, comfortable horror film, the adults here, they feel detached and emotionless. Um, and I think another problem I have with the film is like this technology that that's inside the buddy doll. It seems too good to be true. I mean, why market this inside of a doll that no one over the age of seven is going to want? I mean, this is clearly like an adult oriented technology. No child, you know, under the age of seven is going to be interested in that. So, you know, just like no adult is going to be interested in that doll. So it's like, it's a ludicrous setup that you just kind of have to go with. And if you do the film pretty much rewards you by it kind of like ticks all the right boxes. I mean, it looks great. It's fast paced. It's got some darkly, um, you know, humorous moments without becoming kind of like uh, kind of the sub Rodney Dangerfield stand up comedy routine that Chucky eventually did become. Um, I don't know. I just I think it's just plain fun, despite, you know, its inherent stupidity. Cool. Have you seen mm-hmm. anyone? Anyone else seen it? Mm-hmm. Sorry. I saw it. Uh, I wasn't a fan of that one, but that's probably true of a lot of remakes that I've seen in the last mm-hmm. 10 years. I don't well, know. I just- Put me, it just, ter- just turned me off from the beginning, like having a disgruntled third world country factory worker uh, set set off this uh, chain of events, which uh, lead to Chucky being evil. I felt a little bit wrongheaded, and I, I just didn't I, I didn't care for the setup. I didn't care for the actual movie. I mean, it just didn't work really work for me at all. Um, there were some good things. It was glossy looking and and, and um, 
uh, some of the kills were pretty interesting. Um, but other than that, yeah, I was kind of like zoned out while watching it in the theater. Mm. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I'm kind of losing track of who we've spoken to, but I don't think Joseph, you haven't given us your. Well, uh, Eric, Eric is still. Are you still? No, that, sorry, still. that was me. That was this. That was yeah. it for me. Yeah. Oh, so I guess I will go then. Yes. Oh, I've actually been watching a lot this past couple of weeks as well. Um, as far as more movies, I watched uh, Bloodline, which uh, this is a novelty because it starred Sean William Scott. He's playing a way against type. And to his credit, he's actually quite good here. He's just kind of this detached, uh, emotionless killer. I mean, he's like he's kind of like Dexter without all the uh, the idiot monologuing. Um, the film is pretty gross in places as well. It's uh, got some very, very effective gore scenes and a very almost nauseatingly realistic childbirth scene. It's kind of shown in that sort of Ren and Stimpy style close up. I mean, it's really just gross. Um, it, 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 it's kind of um, it's the right shade of fun, uh, you know, and it's also just being on the side of darkness just enough to make it more seem more serious than it really is. I mean, it's basically just a, a movie version of Dexter with uh, Sean William Scott playing Dexter. That's wh- that's really what all it is. It has a ludicrous uh, finale, but it's just a it's just kind of a uh, kind of a grimly fun little ninety minute you know waste of time. I'd say. Okay, uh, is, is you say that's on Netflix? Yeah, it's called mm. Bloodline. It's from like last year or this year. Uh, Sean William Scott from the American Pie films. Cool. I've not I've not seen it yet, but it's one to watch out for. So, uh, is there anything else, Joseph? Yes, um, I saw another movie called Amelie or Emily. I don't know how to pronounce that. It's um, kind of a semi twist on the home invasion thriller, which is uh, in here. It's essentially about this babysitter who's hired to watch three kids for an evening. Only there's trouble afoot, of course. This being sort of a uh, sort of a home invasion thriller, I'd say. Uh, the villain here is very unique, and uh, it's a really neat spin on the the, the usual kind of home invasion kind of trope. Um, and this person has a pretty solid reasoning behind why they would want to invade this house as well. I'm I'm actually trying to be very very vague here because I don't want to spoil the plot. But um, there's some really uncomfortable scenes here with the bad guy forces this group to do things that they really don't want to do. And it's, um, and it's shot beautifully too, but I think it kind of runs out of steam about 15 minutes before it's all over. And then the film literally limps to its conclusion. I'm not, I'm not I mean, it literally does. You just have to see it to understand what I'm talking about. I mean, it's a unique little kind of character drama, thriller, home invasion thing, but I ultimately forgettable. It just feels like something though that Nathan might like, because I know he likes those home invasion movies with a, uh, you know, like down with great downbeat endings. He loves them. I thought you meant that Nathan like forgettable endings. movies. Hate them. <laughs> yeah, he does hate. He does love unique but forgettable movies. Yes, but I don't like um, downbeat movies because that's not fun. Yeah, I was referencing that one movie that you seem to hate. I can't. Remember. Uh, what was it? I don't, I don't know. There's a, there's a few that I Eden Lake. Eden Lake. Uh, oh. I don't hate that movie. I hate that ending. Yeah. Okay. Well, has anyone seen Emily or the, uh, what was the other one you mentioned, Joseph? It was the Bloodline. Bloodline. Hmm. I think I have, I'm either started watching Emily or, or, or I heard about it. It's kind of one of those ones. I might've been a couple of martinis in. I don't remember much about it, but it does sound familiar. So I'll check it out and see if it is the same one. But uh, thank you, Joseph. Anything else? Yeah, just a couple more things. Um, I, f- after many years, I decided to give American Horror Story a chance because they, they, they're they doing the 1984. And the um, the adverts make it seem like it's just going to be like, you know, teens at summer camp getting stalked by Cropsy for 13 episodes. I'm like, okay, I'm in. And two episodes in, I feel like it's already falling into that same trap as the previous 349 seasons. And that's that Ryan Murphy and his writers are trying to be cute, you know, and they they refuse to tell a linear, coherent story. I mean, I'm so disappointed that there's like seemingly no mystery and it's already just starting to feel like it's they're trying to fill like a hat to the brim with useless stuff like, oh, there's a ghost character now. Oh, these two serial killers are probably going to fight. Oh, there's all this character drama. And this, every character just so happened to have this insanely tragic backstory. It's like so unbelievable. I know this is like a supernatural show, but I don't know. 
I went into this thinking finally they're gonna you know just do something slasherific and it's just already fallen off the rails for me. So eh, eh, eh. Mm, I've been watching that as well. Yeah, I've been watching it as well. It's only going to be it's only going to be six episodes, I believe, according to Wikipedia. Oh, yeah, but uh, so yeah, episode three airs tonight over here. Um, Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I I love the retro nineteen eighties feel, and some of the characters look very Spandau Ballet, and that's drawing me in. But yeah, when I saw episode two. Uh, like I've only ever watched the first season of American Horror Story and I didn't like it. I felt it was convoluted. Every character had to be quirky. It felt like there was no, um, you know, ordinary Joe for you to to sort of side with or to, you know, allow you into the narrative. And I'm finding the same with this one. There's no ordinary characters. They all have stupid quirks or they're all weird in some way. And uh, yeah, they've introduced a supernatural element in episode two and you're like, okay, so it's going to, you know, anything's on, you know, any, it'll do anything now. It's not it's going to be a slasher series as such. Although I haven't said that, it'd be very difficult to do a slasher series. You know, six episodes would amass to four and a half hours, I think. And to do a slasher movie of that length would be ludicrous, I think, because the slasher format just can't sustain that running time. So they obviously had to do something else. But yeah, I'm going to watch it to the end because it's only, as I said, only six episodes. So it's not that much of an investment. But yeah, I can see it not living up to what I had hoped after watching, you know, the Yeah, I mean, and, and there's there's still time for, you know, them to steer the ship in the right direction. But I just so far, I'm just like, it just seems, you know, familiar territory. And that's why I haven't watched the rest of the series. It just mm. seemed to me, it seems like they're about to, uh, to basically remake the final girls or something. It's that. That's uh, what it feels like, doesn't mm. it? Yeah. Except final girls was actually good. I really liked final girl. Yeah. yeah. I love that one. Yeah. Me, are you catching up with it in the moment or are you? I think watched the, uh, the first episode mm. and I yeah, had by the end of it, I was like, Oh, this is going to go off the rails into another terror <laughs> in, in other territories. So I wasn't kind of that into it. It was okay mm. for what I watched. I thought the characters were fairly enjoyable. I think the setting was kind of fun. You know, it's pretty, it's pretty much a very glossy kind of very now look at eighties, but uh, yeah, it was enjoyable enough. But then, I'm just kind of waiting for everyone else's opinion on this one. Like mm. if this one's going to really go off the rails by episode two and three, and it uh, sounds like that's happened already. So, um, so I may just, I may not return to it, but we'll see. yeah, it might be worth waiting to see when the reviews are in. But, uh, what about you, Nathan? Are you, are you watching it? Yes. I've seen the first two episodes. I'm going to watch the third one tonight. I'm really enjoying it, but honestly, um, I'm not that sold on them bringing in the not stalker Richard Ramirez because I'm like, I prefer my 80s slashers to be like fictional slashers. Hmm. Like Mm, I don't really want to be reminded of a real serial killer that really butchered people. You know what I mean? That's that's a bad taste for sure. There's no mystery behind the mystery, the Mr. Jingles character. And then they bring in a guy who's going to talk a lot. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm fine with the Mr. Jingles character because he's fictional. I mean, I do prefer like a little mystery element. I would love for there to be some also like an, instead of a Richard Ramirez character, like just dump that whole idea and just have like Mr. Jingles, but also some mysterious killer. Um, It could be a la, you know, last, slumber party where one killer wasn't even aware that there was another one (laughs) like that would be a lot of fun but i just don't really like the richard ramirez thing that is really throwing me off i don't like it well they do that i love Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) so sorry i i I love the the head counselor i can never remember her name the one who got her ear cut off by mr jingles Um, i love her character and i love i think her name is denise it's the black lady um who was dancing in the second episode. I, I hope she survives to the end. If she does, then I'll, I'll, I'll take back every bad thing I've said about this season. Really? You'll take back every yeah, bad love, thing you said, as long as she survives. <laughs> I love her character. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm what's sure throwing me off is that, mm-hmm. sorry, the, who, what's the name of the actor who plays Mr. Jingles again? Um, oh, that's um, John Carroll Lynch. John Carroll Lynch, yeah, because he's normally like smoking hot, but they've made him up to look not smoking hot, and I'm not happy about that. <laughs> you prefer your serial killers to be smoking hot? Yeah, like because he's in um, uh, Gothica, which is a film with a title that Justin would like. Um, you know, with uh, Halle Berry, that film where he plays the serial killer. Spoiler yeah, alert! Also- <laughs> and his shirt comes off at the end. <laughs> huh. He was also Drew Carey's cross-dressing brother in the, the Drew Carey Show. Oh, whatevs. He could cross-dress me anytime he wants. Oh, Eric. Yes. Okay. Go and have some private time. 
So <laughs> bringing um, this to a, a very respectable level, Eric. <laughs> yeah, as usual. As usual. <laughs> yeah. But so American Horror Story, well, I'm sure we'll be discussing it over the next uh, few episodes. So um, uh, anything else, Joseph? Yeah, one last thing, and I'm saving this for last because I was so pleased with part of it, um, was the Creep Show TV series. Um, I've only seen the first episode so far, and the first episode has two tales, and they're like 20 minutes long each. Uh, the first one's called Grey Matter, and it's uh, it's a lot of gooey sort of uh, assault on Precinct 13 meets the thing, you know, style fun. But I felt like it could have used about 10 extra minutes of uh, story to it, I think. But the second tale, The House of the Head, is one of the most original premises I've ever seen. I loved it. Uh, it's very creepy, and it's very suspenseful. And it's just very, very unique. I mean, I was enthralled from the very beginning to the very end. I mean, this is a great start to the series so far. And this that second tale is just it's just so unique. It's so it's just so original. I loved it. I haven't seen mm. it yet, but I'm sure I'll catch up. Has anyone else had a chance to uh catch I've up? seen it, yes. Mm. And uh, I, I, I probably aren't as enthusiastic as um, Joseph is, but I did really enjoy it. And um, it's just refreshing to see a TV show come along where you don't have to sit and watch 12 hour long episodes where you can just creep show is something you can dip in and out of. I mean, there's only going to be six episodes of this as well, apparently. Um, but it's just nice to see this type of stuff again, where it's Twilight's only and each segment is only 20 minutes long. It's it's just nice. And uh, I, I really enjoyed the Grey Matter segment. I Apparently, it's uh, I was just wikipediaing it after i watched it it's uh, one of the stories from night shift by stephen king and yeah <laughs> i could have used it i could have used a little less daddy he's my daddy where's my daddy <laughs> Yeah, he did say that. He did, he did say that quite a lot. But I thought it was. I mean, it had great special effects and a, a, a gooey thingy type monster. Um, yeah, it was really, and but the, yeah, the second one is, is really unique. I suppose it, there's, it's not a spoiler to say it's about a haunted dollhouse. Um, that's all you need to know. Uh, it, that's made obvious in the opening sixty seconds, so it's not a spoiler. Yeah. But it, it is really interesting, and you know. but I mean, I I think the ending is a little abrupt in that tale. But I just I love mm. the build up. The build up is so just so enthralling to watch. It I is highly yeah. highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. Mm. Cool. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. If I was that kid, I would not be able to sleep in the same room as that house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, right. Well, thank you, Joseph. So, Nathan, we haven't done you. Me, yet, I have honest, Meep, Meep, have you seen Creep Show? Mm. No, I haven't. Uh, I'm a big okay. fan of the movie and the sequel. Uh, to me, it's a hard sell. If, uh, you know, obviously George Romero is not going to be involved, and Stephen King's not involved, so it's kind of a, a real hard sell. And plus, I don't have Shutter. Don't care if to have Shutter. So, uh, so yeah, it might be hard for me to get to that one eventually. But yeah, but your rev- reviews of it definitely make me more curious about it for sure. Well, the first story is based on a Stephen King short story, so he is cool. there, kind of, yeah. And the second one is from the writer of something famous. I was reading the what was it, Joseph? I can't remember. I looked the, the dude guy, up on Wikipedia. Yeah, the dude who wrote that short story uh, became really famous for something since, but I can't remember what it was. So that's the end of that story. Bye. <laughs> thank yeah, you yeah. thank you eric for that so okay well nathan, i will google it while you're talking to yes nathan. please do uh nathan how about you well i'm afraid eric's gonna have to google fast because i've we've pretty much covered um i think my recently seen was the same as a lot of your guys has recently seen so we've covered everything but i will say that a movie that I've heard of recently is called Clownado about a tornado with clowns in it. So I need to watch that. So that's going to be something I'm going to have to, you know, check out very, very soon. Cool. Have you Googled? I'm trying. I'm trying. Oh, Give me Eric. Seconds. Well, let me, I'll just talk uh, briefly about the, I think uh, I say we've covered a lot of things um, already, uh, but um, I caught up with Crawl, which is the uh, alligator was it alligators? I guess it is alligator on crocodiles. Alligator. Oh, um, I thought you said crawl. I was like, oh. <laughs> the 1983 science fiction fantasy movie. What, the crow? <laughs> crawl. No, it's crawl. Oh, crawl. No, no, no. No, it's K R U L L. Yes. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Yeah. No, this is the um, one by uh, the director. It's Alexander Adja, uh, um, who I think he, he directed um, uh, Switchblade Romance, didn't he? High Tension. Uh, has anyone seen Crawl yet? It's um, yes, no, yes. yes. What no, did you but think? I want to. Mm. What did you think, Meep? It was enjoyable, and I liked it. I, I like a good animal attack kind of movie, and it's that. Uh, my only critique of it is that it's 
way too much of the movie is actually in the crawl space that it's a little too i felt like they could have opened up the movie a little bit more and it would have Mm. been like there needed to be like a third act where it was outside of the crawl space or outside of the house and i and i think it would have been a a much more enjoyable experience i think it was just a little too grimy and crawl spacey for me Mm. (laughs) maybe maybe that's my own uh phobias coming out but i just thought it was a little too um it's a little too one note, maybe a lot of a lot of the a lot of same scenes, um, but I enjoyed it. I like the lead actress. I think you know Alexander Adra is kind of a director who's very hit or miss uh, for me, um, but I think he did a good job with this one. And um, it's not quite enjoyable like Piranha, the Piranha 3D movies, and their silly goofiness. There's a lack of uh, goofiness, but there is some humor there, so it's not depressing. And boobies, uh, and yeah, there's that. So. <laughs> So yeah, I, I definitely liked it, and uh, uh, but could have could have been a little bit more enjoyable with another another act of uh, yeah. No, I, I would agree with that. It wasn't as uh, it was kind of popcorny in this in the way I can I guess it felt almost like TV movie movie ish. Nothing against TV movies, obviously. If Amanda's listening, but. It it didn't. Um, it, 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 I, I agree with your uh, surmising. It's kind of one note because it had a decent budget. Uh, it looked great, um, but it didn't feel and it had all the elements there. But I think it was it, it was quite repetitive. Which uh, you know, if you are trying to escape from a crawl space under a house uh, surrounded by lots of alligators, then it's lots of people swimming across uh, the basement to open doors or trying to get through trap doors or various things like that and um rinse and repeat um but yeah i'd liked it enough but it was uh I, you know if you think back to the movies like piranha or even like the uh the remake the piranha and uh its sequel uh i had more fun with those um but it's a decent a decent watch but uh yes okay Right. Well, uh, we set the world to rights uh, for what we've been watching recently. So it'd be interesting Hang on, to see. I've got, oh. I've got the, the oh, scoop. Yeah. Okay, the scoop. Okay, so the House Hot of the, the Head in, in, in Creepshow was written by Josh Mailerman, who has since become famous for the, as being the author of Bird Box, that movie that spawned the craze uh, where people are going around with blindfolds on. So there we go. Thank you. And one other thing. I uh, highly recommend everyone who's any interest in The Prey purchases the new Blu-ray from Arrow, which is available uh, in the UK and in the US as well. It's got a, uh, an incredible print, which makes it look spick and span and brand new. And it's got a great commentary track by Ewan Kant and also Amanda Reyes. A very entertaining listen. And if you want to see what Ewan Kant looks like in just a pair of skimpy shorts, then watch the extras. Mm. Okay, well, you're you're like uh, um, the uh, the lead in uh, our feature presentation, aren't you? Our kind of a roving reporter. Yes, I am. You're like a, a in many a, ways, like a Nancy <laughs> Drew in more ways than one. Yes. So, um, is, there, is there any? Are there? Is there any chance of him getting strangled? <laughs> what by a uh, rude by her kind of like a hefty no, uh, middle-aged man to save I, imagine your life, Eric. Mm. I was just trying to save your life Eric. Oh, okay i wasn't, okay. Insinu- well, I wasn't I- insinuating you should be strangled okay well then i appreciate your concern right okay well uh it's a i'm sure eric would like to be taken roughly from behind by a, a hefty middle-aged man but um Ooh, yeah. we shall, yes i thought you might say that so but anyway before i couldn't find a trailer for eyes of a stranger so what i've done is i've done a kind of little bit of a mashup um of the siskel and ebert uh, review from their coming attraction show of 1981 i think it was coming attractions wasn't it but uh, anyway this is uh them and this is their rave review um with a few sound clips from the movie of uh, eyes of a stranger our next picture eyes of a stranger is an extremely well-made film too but it's a hideously brutal thriller about a murdering maniac loose in Miami. On his trail is Lauren Tews, the cruise director on TV's Love Boat, and her fans are going to be quite surprised by this film. In the picture, she plays a television reporter who discovers that the killer lives in a high-rise apartment building next door to her own. And in an effort to find out more about him, she snoops around his apartment while he's away. (laughs) 
That scene is even more scary in the theater when you see it alone in the dark because the movie has made this creep out to be a ruthless, cold-blooded, vicious killer. He sticks knives in people's throats and then he twists the knives. It's all very disgusting and very bloody. So while we admire the technique of the movie making here, it's a good thriller. We're regularly being grossed out by the film's excessive brutality. The killer first terrorizes his victims by calling them on the telephone and in an effort to give him a taste of his own medicine, Lauren Tews begins calling him. Yes? Is anyone there? I know what you're doing. And I know it's you, Mr. Herbert. Eyes of a Stranger is a strange bird in the mad slasher movie category. It's better made than all the other ones I've seen in the last year, but it still is needlessly gross and vile. There's no reason why we have to suffer through a scene where the killer slaps around a blind teenage girl before sexually attacking her. This is very rough stuff and hardly legitimate entertainment. So I can't recommend Eyes of a Stranger, even though I must admit I admire the skillful way in which the film is put together. You know, my reaction had some of the same ambivalence. It's kind of funny. One week you'll walk into a movie that's violent, disgusting, gruesome, and horrifying, and bad. <laughs> and it's very easy to make up your mind about that. But in a way, this sort of film is even more disturbing because it's made with a certain amount of craftsmanship yes, and is. artistry. You walk in, you sit down, you admire the way the film is put together, and at the same time, it's got these really unsavory elements in it. They're a real turnoff. It's even more horrifying in a way. So many people want to do is make a real disgusting horror film. They're easy to sell, and they do sell, and they can be and made maybe cheaply. maybe this, this guy probably has a screenplay he would like to make if he could get the finance. So I, I really did have that ambivalent feeling. I said, here's a guy who's prostituting his talent with some really rough stuff. And at the same time, I was very disturbed by the reaction that the audience had. For example, there's one scene in the movie where the blind girl is calling for her seeing eye dog. The killer has already killed the dog. Right. She's clapping for the dog to come. The whole audience is whistling and clapping and making fun of this girl. It's as if the inhumanity on the screen has leaked out into the theater. Well, it's really disturbing. And, of course, there's the scene where they're slapping the, the kid around. I mean, you're just wondering what you're watching. It's more like a crime than a movie. That's a very good observation. So, another rave from Siskel and Ebert uh, for the early 80s slasher movie. And I think it's always a kind of timely, it's always good to be reminded of just how hated these movies were back in the day. And um, I've got uh, some more reviews I'll kind of uh, read little clips of uh, from later. Now, Eyes of a Stranger, it's, 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 it's a strange one, I kind of guess, because it came from the uh, the production company, Georgetown Productions, who hit pay dirt with um, Friday 13th the year before, and uh, which Paramount obviously put out on Cisco Lou, but um, helped, uh, obviously, much their disgust to make it uh, into a massive box office bonanza and a cultural phenomenon by attacking Paramount and Betsy Palmer. Uh, and Warner Brothers picked, out, uh, picked up uh, The Eyes of a Stranger and uh, put it out thinking they might have another Friday 13th style uh, cash cow on their hands it wasn't that in it's eyes of the stranger is very much of the ilk of the uh you had kind of two types of slasher movies certainly in 1981 and 1980 uh, you had your popcorn slasher movies like friday 13th hell night um my bloody valentine uh which are kind of more kind of uh, more about having a good time at the movies more of a kind of roller coaster ride and Eyes of a Stranger, which very much falls more into the uh, the, the camp of maniac, uh, um, uh, don't go in the house, uh, th those types of movies where you have what, for one of that term, is kind of more of a serious look at a, a serial killer, of course. But having said, adding in all the very exploitative elements of um of the kind of the grindhouse so it's strange to see uh, these films being put out by warner brothers who uh, you know 40 years before would have been putting out joan crawford movies and uh you know big budget uh, kind of blockbusters so it was kind of interesting that this kind of time uh, what was what's happening and uh, so but what i found particularly interesting in the siskel and ebert um, review the, the all of the it's a disgusting movie all those kind of things it doesn't surprise me because we know that's exactly what they thought about movies like this at the time. But they were talking about how well made the movie was. Now, for me, I think it is, it's professionally made, but it seems to have... Um, uh, it, it's it's un, un intent, unintentional, I imagine, good humour through uh, Lauren Tooze's uh, character as this kind of Nancy Drew-esque 
um, uh, reporter who's a, a, she's a, I'm not even sure she's actually a reporter. She's like a news lady, sort of reads the news. But um, she decides after telling everyone that they should go, um, you know, serial killer on the loose and they should report to the police any strange behaviour. Uh, she goes out of her way not to report this, um, her suspicions that well, her neighbour is a serial killer, even though she is correct, he is a serial killer, and we know that this isn't a who done it, it's not even a why done it, it's just he done it. Um, that uh, she's she's dogged in her determination to bring him to turn the tables on him. Um, but uh, Tuz is kind of she, her character is is it kind of it's from the kind of Dana, Dana Kimmel school of acting in Friday Thirteen Part Three. It's very earnest, but that earnestness becomes kind of comedic in some degree, which I enjoyed. And Jennifer Jason Lee is is I think when I reread my review for Hysteria Lives when I gave it one and a half stars out of five is it feels like she's um she's thinks she's in a better movie than she she actually is um so it's a, it's a strange uh movie and there's there's a whole you know we go talk hours and hours about the sexual politics and social politics of 1981 and what was going on there and um i saw the stuff about the movie being picketed although i didn't actually see any evidence in my research that, that actually happened but i know uh, a number of movies were picketed uh, around that time, like Dressed to Kill and Maniac, and of course later Silent Night, Deadly Night. But um, it's yeah, it's a strange mixture of uh, a film where they kind of, um, as we'll talk about, they kind of retrofitted to some degree what was going to be more of a kind of conventional thriller into a more of a Friday 13th gore fest or an attempt to do that with getting Tom Savini on on hand with special effects it's not entirely successful but it does have passages of quite you know of good suspense there's a great scene where where um the Lauren Two's character is going around the killer's apartment and she kind of hangs off his balcony about sort of five stories up of this this kind of sun bleached uh, Miami apartment block and she managed to swing and drop into the apartment below, uh, the balcony below, which I'm not sure if it's actually possible, but she managed to do that. So it has, yeah, it has, it, I, I'm endlessly fascinated by this this year and this, this, this time period. Obviously, I've been banging on about it for over 20 years, but... Um, it's not a film, I wouldn't say it's a film that I warm to, especially that I really like, but I kind of appreciate it perhaps a bit more, um, possibly for the wrong reasons. Uh, and one of the, uh, one of the attractive things to it, I kind of guess to some degree, even though for all the wrong reasons is it's kind of movie that you just wouldn't be made now by a major studio and certainly wouldn't be released onto American screens. Um, so yeah, I'm curious, uh, to see what you guys think of it. So Meep, um, you know, as you are our special guest, uh, you can go first. So what are your thoughts on I? of a stranger i'm actually a fan of eyes of a stranger i've have been for a long time now and what attracts me to slasher movies of this time period you get a lot of clones of say friday 13th and halloween and then you get lots of other kinds of flash movies that go more from the killer's point of view and they kind of go into different little tangents so you get a little bit of variety uh, whereas a lot of uh, mainstream critics of course at the time were dismissing these things as just, just knockoffs and just disgusting vile knockoffs as obviously us uh, uh, ebert and siskel uh did uh mention and as well as some of the other reviews that you might uh, be reading out later uh, i like that they mentioned that the movie is well made and it is actually pretty well made i think ken wiederhorn is a pretty good director he had previously made uh, shockwaves before this film and of course shockwaves makes an appearance in this film as it's playing on a screen and it's kind of played out pretty long and i, and I like that I like a little bit of a homage uh, there's a director's homage to himself uh I'm, I'm i'm for that there's a little bit of a wall breaking i guess so you could look at it that way um i just yeah just love these kinds of slasher movies that uh kind of go a little bit uh, thriller or procedural or uh, in this case i would deem this as an anchor woman peril plot uh so this one pairs well with visiting hours for me uh, lee grant playing kind of a, an anchor woman in that here lauren twos from the love boat who i uh, adored on the love boat i was watching the love boat at the time and i was uh, i was all in because julie our friendly cruise director is now in a slasher movie of sorts and so i watched this film when it came out in theaters I was young, and I thought something about 
how suspenseful they were. And this was very suspenseful for me at the time. I think it does have a good suspense uh, throughout the film. I think it is, uh, yeah, it is undercut maybe by some of the sleazy aspects of the film, but I appreciate them as well because uh, you were still getting kind of a, a griminess and sleaziness in early 80s cinema that kind of definitely went away by the end of the 80s and became something else, uh, more in a director video world. Um, so I was appreciating seeing these kinds of films as they came out and as they came to home video. And, uh, I, I just follow this character as she, uh, she, uh, she pretty quickly, uh, finds out who this, who this, uh, f- uh killer is. And, uh, what I liked about this movie is that it doesn't really, uh, hide the identity of the killer. I like that the killer is pretty much, uh, could be anyone off the street, um, and I like that, uh, in this movie and saying Lee Grant and visiting hours, men are never taking them seriously. They have to do it themselves. And definitely by the end of this movie, this is a women, uh, who are in peril, but also have to take matters in their own hands, not depending on men to rescue them. I'm a big fan of those kinds of slasher movies. And that's what we love about the Friday 13th movies. And this one has a good final girl in Jane, who kind of reminded me at the time of Jane Fonda as well. So I like that she was named Jane. Another thing that I love is the uh, setting in Florida. I like a good Florida uh, horror movie. I think Florida is a pretty scary place, as we know. Lots of crazy shit happens there. And so this is a perfect place to set a really sleazy kind of story. When you look up IMDb, the keywords are that come up uh, immediately are sex maniac, pervert, sexual predator, sexual violence, psychopath, stalking voyeur. So this is the kind of movie, uh, uh, a movie for our times, <laughs> uh, since uh, we're, we're being led by someone like that. Um, I like that it's set in an apartment building setting. I'm a huge fan of movies set in apartment buildings, uh, movies like Shivers, and I like movies like uh poltergeist 3 even uh so i'm a big fan of that so there's echoes of and shades of rear window with her seeing the killer across the way of course it's not quite as classy as a thriller of a hitchcock thriller but i think it gets the job done um i love that the movie culminates um in stalking and terrorizing uh poor dear uh jennifer jason lee who's deaf mute and and blind uh, that she's suffering from a PS, uh, PTSD to an extreme form from a past trauma with a child molester and somehow the killer unravels her condition. To me, that's kind of a cinematic uh, equivalent of a bonk on the head, which happens in movies. I like that it happens here. Um, this movie, I feel like, would have been quite frightening for women to see in theaters. I think it really plays upon the fears of walking home alone at night and and uh, the idea of, uh, of a killer out there on the loose, and there's not much you can do about it. And I think it goes out of its way to show you how terrible men are. Jane's boyfriend, um, who's at odds with Jane because she seems to be choosing to be the put-upon big sister instead of shacking up with him. I think he sympathizes and he seems nice enough, but in the end, um, it's really Jane's story and Jane who has to step up. He's not essential to solving uh, Jane's a mystery. If anything, he proves to be a stumbling block. And uh, I really uh, hate that they go to a movie theater and I think it's playing either Dawn of the Dead or Being There and they're talking throughout the movie. Really rude. <laughs> Miller had reason enough to, to go after them uh, based on that fact. I don't like when people talk in movies. That was a little pet peeve I had with the movie. <laughs> um, but I think Lauren Tews, again, is very likable as Jane. Um, she was very likable on The Love Boat and I think she brings that likability there. Her acting chops may not be on the par with, say, Jennifer Jason Leigh, who's clearly giving her all. I think Jennifer Jason Leigh, since day one as an actress, is the kind of actress who gives, fully gives herself over to performance, and it really shows. And that's why you may have mentioned that she seems like she she thinks she's in a, a much better film, and that's true. But I think that's how she is with every role she takes on as an actress, and that's why I love her as an actress. Um, it's one of her first film roles. She had done some TV stuff before here, so I, I like that uh, she was really uh, pretty outstanding here. And the killer himself, I think uh, the actor's name is John DeSanti, he has that ordinariness uh, that's he's not some hulking mass killer. He could be the schlub you encounter on a daily basis, and uh, someone who may be living in your very own apartment complex. Um, 
And there's other elements about the film that I like, and I'll get into them a little bit later, but I uh, kind of want to hear your opinions on them. Cool. Okay. Thank you, Meep. Uh, so, uh, yes. Well, Nathan, uh, what are your views on Eyes of a Stranger? Oh, I really enjoy Eyes of a Stranger. Uh, <clears throat> I've always found the finale to be um, pretty suspenseful. I think scenes, especially to me, scenes where uh, Jennifer Jason Lee is – um, you know, alone in the apartment and he's broken in, you know, and, and killed her dog and he's moving stuff out of the way. And it's almost like he's just, I mean, he's messing with her because he's like kind of amping up her terror because I mean, in, in her situation, I mean, you know where you've set something and then you suddenly it's not there. I mean, that would be a terrifying uh, situation. So yeah, I think the the ending especially is great. I love, love the head in the fish tank gag. That's just one of my favorites. And uh, I believe it was done also in uh, He Knows You're Alone. Um, but that's just an awesome, awesome scene. I love that a cuckoo clock plays such a vital role in this movie because <laughs> I love cuckoo clocks. So I absolutely uh, thought that was uh, a lot of fun. Can I just um, ask you, sorry, Nathan, just to, just to, just to otherwise I forget, but the, the cuckoo clock is kind of the uh, the, whole, the whole thing, and I, I played the clip with Lauren to uh, Jane's character asking about the cuckoo clock, and there's the scene, isn't there, with the woman in the, the office block when the killer's uh, phoning her and even managed to phone her in the lift, and he's playing the, the music box, which we're led to believe is the cuckoo clock. So do you think he took the cuckoo clock with him? Hmm, good just question. Thought, yes. Mm. I did not think about that whatsoever. Well, it's, you know what it is? It's the, it's the ringtone of his <laughs> iPhone. Uh, ah, in 1981, yeah. it's a time travel movie yeah. as well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Nathan, uh, it's just like, an aside. That's okay. Uh, like me, I do love a good amount of sleuthing, and I did find it fun, you know, that she decided to kind of mess with him and call him and, and, and mess with him. Although in reality, that would probably be a really incredibly stupid decision. Um, but in the movie, it was fun to watch. Um yeah, I think that Eyes of a Stranger is is really good. Um, honestly, for me, I'm very much more into a Friday the 13th style slasher. Like, that's kind of, if I had to decide, like, the type of slasher I love the most, it's the Friday the 13th and all its copycats that I love the most. Um, but movies like this I find very interesting and very very interesting, like, change of pace for the slasher film. So, yeah, um, definitely a recommendation for me. Um I think it's uh, great, although, um, uh, yeah, some of the acting is ca- kind of dodgy. But again, I kind of like that in my 80s movies. <laughs> I love I love dodgy acting. I think it's amazing. Excellent. Well, thank you, Nathan. We know we know you love dodgy acting, so uh, not a great surprise, but thank you. Um, well, it's because I'm such a good <laughs> actor. Well, of course. A selfish relative. Eric thinks so. I do. South turn. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, Joseph, what about you? Oh, I love Eyes of a Stranger. It's it's such a bad, poorly written movie, um, but it's done so well. For one, I love the, the opening scene with the, the girl. She's walking home, and then they have that jump scare where she bumps into someone. It's not just someone. It's like this random rabbi just wandering around out in the dark. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> and this is actually a really great opening because she gets into the apartment and uh, – the guy calls her and she's kind of fumbling around the dark and you know, he's in there and it's like, when is he going to strike? And it's, it's really effective, really creepy and suspenseful. Unfortunately, it gets a little too rapey for my taste, but um, this is the one in one movie where uh, there's really no mystery behind the killer, but that's okay. Um, we don't really get like any insight into him. Like, Oh, his mother abused him or, his dad was never there. It's just a guy. He's just doing it. That's it. Uh, so I, I kind of enjoyed that. I, you know, I, like Eric and I always say, we like our killers with, um, you know, mystery and wearing silly masks. And uh, he, he wears like a, uh, I guess, a pantyhose over his head for a lot of it. But there's really no mystery here. But I didn't mind that here. Um, the uh, the boyfriend character and Jennifer Jason Lee. I'll get more. I'll get more into her later. But. The boyfriend, the boyfriend character is just a completely useless character. His only function in the film is just to say, no, I'm a lawyer, and uh, they'll have that thrown out of court. He's just, like, like Meep said, he's just a stumbling block. That's his only function in the film. But that's okay because this is a, uh, this is a girl's show, and I think uh, – uh, what's her name? Twos? What's her, what's her first name again? Lauren Twos. Lauren yeah, Lauren Drews. I think she's so she's so annoyingly endearing here, like that kind of that bug-eyed, 
um, a scream for help. Uh, oh, we got to stop. We got to go. We got to investigate and stop uh, the evil. I mean, she just goes out of her way to do dumb things, and I love it. I just I could watch her the the whole movie, and I I enjoyed her more than Jennifer Jason Lee. If I'm honest, because Jennifer Jason Lee, I think it's just nothing more than a plot device. Um, she has real, no real character development outside of, oh, um, she was psychosomatically deaf and blind, and now she's not. That's it. Her only function to be there is because her sister um, is you know, concerned for her safety, and she needs to be put in danger later. But that's okay. I, I bought it. Um, I just had a lot of fun with it. I especially like the scene where um, the, uh, the killer's in the apartment. He's, he's after Jennifer Jason Lee. And she's hiding in the closet. And I think she's got her hands over her eyes. And I'm like, why would you do that? I love the way he just pulls the clothes back. She's just standing there. Uh, and it's just so funny because she's, she doesn't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's terrible to laugh at that, but I don't know. I just found it funny. Um, some of the suspense in this film is really good. I mean, it's so manufactured, you know, like the Jennifer Jason Lee character just being this plot device. But it's just, like I said, it's done so well. It's shot so well. The music is just great. I love that kind of do do. Just it's very very subtle um, soundtrack. Um, no, it's just it's just a very creepy movie. I was uh I was shocked at how much I enjoyed it. I'd seen it a long time ago. I think we watched this at uh on movie night at Greg's like ten years ago, and I'd forgotten all about it. But um, I enjoyed all I enjoyed it a lot watching it uh, this week. So yeah, thumbs up for me definitely. Excellent, thank you, Joseph. Uh, Eric, what about you? Yeah, I wouldn't be as enthusiastic about the film as as me, Nathan, and Joseph. I would be more enthusiastic than the one-star review you gave on History of Lives, though. It's one and um, a half. One and a half. One and a half, sorry. One and a half. Um, yeah, as as the guys have said, I mean, I prefer my Friday the 13th or, you know, even something like My Bloody Valentine, where the killer is mysterious and silent. Um I'm not as into the type of slasher like Maniac, Don't Answer the Phone, where the killer is kind of the main character and he has a personality and he speaks and talks. Now, I know he doesn't in this one, uh, which probably is why it possibly I prefer it to Don't Answer the Phone. And I I don't know if I prefer it to Maniac. There's parts of Maniac that I really like. Um, But, uh, you know, so this brand of slasher I, and also the urban setting uh, I'm sort of the opposite of me I don't like the urban setting for slasher movies I like to be them to be out in the countryside in the woods or um, you know just in the middle of nowhere I prefer that type of I don't know the isolation vibe I, I prefer in a slasher having said that I mean my opinion of Eyes of the Stranger is that it's one of the better uh, slasher movies of this type um, I, I do like the the lead actress, the, or the lead character, I should say, this, this news. Well, she's supposed to be a newsreader, but she's constantly breaking out of the sort of formal role of being a newscaster and giving her own opinions on stories, which is quite unprofessional, I think. Mm. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I, I can you imagine like Moira Stewart doing that on the BBC, where she sort of gives out about something mid sentence. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, it feels, I, I thought it felt kind of odd that we see the killer's face quite a lot, but we never really get an insight into his personality as such. It's so it, it, in some ways it's like those films like maniac and don't answer the phone, but in a way it's not because, uh, you know, like in final exam where you see the killer's face at the end, but we never know, get to know anything about him or why he's doing the things he's doing, which I thought was, it just felt like it was, the film felt incomplete because of that. I thought, um, I do like the way that the newscaster turns the tables a bit and starts sending him phone calls. Although, um, <laughs> she makes a bit of a slip up because as a local celebrity on television, um, she forgets the fact that he'll recognize her voice when he hears it, when she's on, the news program so he's able to identify who's sending him these mystery calls um so she kind of dropped the ball on that one um i was also wondering is it possible to phone the emergency phone in an elevator you know, like yes, is there a I number you can like how, how would you how would you find out that number and then get into yes, the back of most, car yeah most of them have a have a like a, a landline hooked into the back of them 
Yeah, I know they have an emergency phone, but how would you get that number to ring it? Uh, I don't it's know. Prob- I don't know. It's probably like stenciled on, on there somewhere Maybe. in case of emergencies. True, yeah. Um, I thought the Tom Savini effects uh, were quite were actually really good. I mean, the decapitation scene at the start I thought was really effective. And then, of course, the head in the fish tank, as Nathan was saying, is, is kind of fun. Um, but overall, yeah, I do. I prefer my, my villains to be more ghost-like. I prefer them to sort of uh, lurk in the background and in, in, in silence I, it just makes the film it makes it more of a horror film these films don't feel to me like horror films they feel like thrillers um whereas ones where if we put a mask on this guy and, and have him sort of loiter around in the background then it suddenly becomes a horror film for me uh overall though yeah much better than i was expect i saw i'd seen it about 20 years ago and this was my second time watching it and i remember it being merely okay and i suppose i still see it as as okay i mean it's entertaining enough but uh it's, it's certainly probably not one i would rewatch very often okay all right thank you eric i mean what do we think uh because obviously it's, it's part of a, a small sub sub genre of news um or anchor women in peril isn't it with uh, uh all around like this the seduction and one thing i was going to ask is do you think this film was like kind of like tinkered with like during shooting like like they intended to make like a thriller and then they threw in like like the desert scene where he's burying the uh the body and he gets stuck in the mud and then they try to help him out and he ends up killing like the two random people. It just felt like, Oh, we need to make this feel like more of a slasher film. So let's pepper this scene in there. Well, yeah, that's exactly what happened. It was, uh, there was some, um, uh, news interviews at the time and Lauren twos was, uh, uh, expressed her dismay at seeing how violent the movie was eventually and she said it got changed while she was making it and apparently they did they did change the movie as they went along to make it more like Friday 13th and in fact it was written by as it Ron Kurz under a pseudonym uh, Mark Jackson and he wrote uh, the Friday 13th sequels and I always thought that sequence at the beginning with the fish head um, the, the head in the fish tank uh, it, it felt very similar in a lot of ways with that, the English um, woman walking around the apartment to the Adrian King uh, opening scene of Friday the 13th Part 2 so which I think um, the, it was the same writer so he, he seemed to have I think this came out in March of 81 and I think Part 2 uh, Friday the 13th Part 2 came out in the summer of 81 I think I might be wrong um, but he kind of retooled that for the opening uh, the opening scene but yeah it was it's say Tom Senior was brought in uh, to do the special effects after the success of Friday the 13th and I don't to be honest I, I don't know if you guys were watching the um because uh, the film was highly censored when it came out, um, but it, it Warner Brothers released the film, which I've got the DVD, which I'm sure is probably the version you've seen. Uh, they released it in, well, probably sort of 10, 15 years ago now on DVD, which had the uncut special effects of Tom Savini, but I didn't think they were that good. I, I like this, the decapitation scene, but it was, certainly wasn't uh sort of betsy palmer having a head chopped off but it was it's slightly if you can call someone having their being stabbed in the neck and having the the knife twisted and blood spurting out of being subtle but it certainly wasn't on the grandstanding kind of grand guggenol kind of uh excesses of friday 13th for tom savini or even something well certainly less gory than maniac for instance uh from just a knife year. though it was a, a meat cleaver being used to cut limes Yes. Yeah, it felt the effects felt just more serviceable rather than grandiose, in my opinion. I did wonder whether or not Tom Savini just got brought in at the last minute, and he was uh, he kind of got brought in, and he, he didn't have much time to do it. And I also wondered if he this was the same time that he the infamous um, uh, kind of mystery about how much he was involved in nightmares and the damaged brain, which of course I think was that was also shot in. Was that part of that shot in Florida, wasn't it? Mm, it was. Yeah, so I wonder, maybe it was the same time he was down there doing this, that he uh, was also uh, doing that. But yeah, I think that sort of film has a bit of a schizophrenic feel to it. It feels like they kind of shoehorning in some of the more exploitative elements and adding the gore. Um, but yeah, I saw at least one news article from the time when Lauren Tews was was a bit shocked that uh that uh that, you know she thought she was making a gritty thriller but she didn't realize that it would be uh be quite so gritty well the exploitation like- elements are my favorite bit yeah so i'm glad they added them in yeah um, i do agree that the about the suspense sequences that you were mentioning uh justin like which is hanging off the balcony i thought that was a good scene and like any scene in a film where somebody is is loitering around someone else's apartment and they're about to come home i always find quite suspenseful as well and it's done well in, in this film too so i think just overall my 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 concern was that once that that opening scene where he starts to kind of rape the woman, I thought the whole film was going to be like that. And, but thankfully they, they, 
they kind of keep that to a minimum, and he, it's more like a cat and mouse thriller. I mean, it's it's totally manufactured, but I think they I think it's done very well. I was surprised that they, uh, given how young Jennifer Jason Lee was, that they uh, they kind of they, you know they basically he ripped off her blouse and you saw her breasts, which I'd, it surprised me that they went went there basically because um uh, one little bit of tidbit just talking sorry that's t- terrible so i didn't mean <laughs> I that at all choice of, words. Words, choice of words was that uh she'd um she'd left school she didn't finish high school she left six weeks early uh to make this movie so she was very young when they did it i mean she must have been over well over 18 i can guess but it it just surprised me that they kind of went there with with the, you know that far for like a, a film that was put out by warner brothers but uh, say it's uh, 1981 it's a different time my question is um she obviously regains her sight at the end and everything um is that why she starts caressing her breast in the mirror because she sees it for the first time because it just kind of seems icky and out of place if that's not it I don't. Well, the whole thing is a little bit odd, isn't it? It's this idea that somehow she's been the killer has done her a favour, which some of the contemporary reviews at the time pointed out and said it was. It kind of it seemed to be pointing to the direction that um, that her all her trauma was from being um, molested as a child, and you see the scene when she's taken off the street, and thankfully you don't see anything else apart from her being taken to hospital afterwards but it's it's this idea that somehow she's cured by being you know attacked as an adult or a you know young adult so it's kind of an that's how you cure hiccups as well you get fright <laughs> yes well i say it's 1981 isn't it but it's kind of what whether or not the uh, the because uh, given that to say the, the the killer had no motivation he was literally as you know a couple of you already said he's like joe schmuck wasn't he just he just had no motivation there was nothing it's not like uh don't go in the house where you've got the the killer is kind of you see that he's been abused by his mother and you know and um in nightmares and damaged brain where you can see all the you know the kind of the, the background and the sort of the mental health the kind of breakdowns and the, the the snarling and the kind of you know the histrionics of of uh, mental illness uh, depicted on screen whereas he just seems like a you know a, a slightly creepy looking guy he just goes around murdering women probably the real serial killers of the time were weren't they mm-hmm. yeah um do you know when this was actually filmed because it 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 feels almost like 1979 early 1980 to me rather than 81 I especially think, those rotary phones i think it would have been filmed after probably i uh, after friday 13th probably not much you know because mm. friday 13th came out it was august 1980 wasn't it so and that was george, uh, george may Dan. i think oh, may, it was may well, sorry no that's right yeah yeah, um, and uh, that was Georgetown Productions as well. So I kind of guess that given that they wanted to sort of ask the success of Friday the 13th, they, they quickly sort of rewrote the script and started adding all these, uh, you know, bring Tom Savini in. Then I'm ki- I am I couldn't find any, ever, you know, exactly when it was filmed, but I imagine it probably uh, was sort of around the time Friday the 13th was going sort of uh, blockbusters at the box office, I would imagine. Before we get into background, I wanted to uh, bring up that scene with uh, Jane, um, and I think there's a layer of feminism running throughout this film, because I think a lot of it is playing on the fears women have of of, of being alone and being uh, being in an urban environment with a serial killer on the loose. I think it definitely plays on those fears, whether it was for exploitation value or whether it was intentional to to do that because a large part of slasher movie audiences at the time were, were female audiences. So I think um, I like the scene with that you guys have mentioned where she turns the tables on the, I love that she calls him the phone freak uh, and the way she responds to calling him over and over are really interesting. I like the way that she, uh, after calling him several times, she lights up a cigarette and then she closes her eyes and puts her head back in an almost sexual way. I think that's pretty interesting. Um, I was reading some passages, if I could uh, read them aloud to you guys, from Men, Women, and Chainsaws, mm. uh, Gender in the Modern Horror Film by Carol Clover. I think uh, um, I think it's good to have a little bit of a female perspective here. Uh, the law fails in Eyes of a Stranger 2, but in a rather different way. A rapist killer, phone freak, is on the loose. But when a woman calls the police to report suspicious phone calls, an officer responds in some irritation that they don't have time to deal with all the inquiries intelligent reports are generating and that they'll try to get out in the morning. The caller is, of course, attacked and killed that night. And when the hero of the piece, Jane, 
begins to suspect one of her neighbors of being the killer and to submit bits of evidence uh, to her criminal lawyer boyfriend, Steve, he is dismissive. Before you start taking the law into your own hands, think for a minute, he says. The evidence is circumstantial, he explains. If he were to take it to court, he would lose and his reputation as an up-and-coming criminal lawyer would be ruined. Indeed, taking the law into her own hands, she shoots the killer in an act of assaulting her sister. It is because the proper authorities refuse to take it into theirs. So clearly, uh, this is very much a movie about a woman taking on the responsibility of protecting the things that she loves. And uh, a little later passage in this book, uh, in his appreciative discussion of Eyes of a Stranger, one of the few notices of any kind the film received, would remark the ways it complicates any simple understanding of sadistic gazing. For one thing, he notes, the film ends with the murderer, definitely dead, uh, in the bathtub, his eyes closed, his glasses still perched, incongruously on his nose, an unflattering reflection for any male who relished the sadistic assaults. Eyes of a Stranger is indeed a departure from the rule, but not of degree, not kind. Not all gazer killers are definitely in, and done away with, with creep of Eyes of a Stranger, but many are, and even those who get off easier do not get off altogether. I think uh, if you read Carol Clover's book, it has some really interesting perspectives on how women have to deal with these uh, these killers in these films and how they're uh, sometimes portrayed in different ways. Sometimes, yes, there are the mass killers, and sometimes I think a scarier version is a killer who could be literally anyone lurking around the corner. So uh, I like what she had to say. There's actually more some interesting passages, but I won't <laughs> spend all, net, all, all, all day reading them. But I, I would urge you guys to definitely check out Men, Women, and Chainsaws by Carol Clover. <clears throat> I think this film is it's kind of ahead of its time. I mean, it, it feels to me sort of like she's uh, using her platform as a news anchor to kind of, you know, get the message out there that, hey, you should take this seriously. There's a stalker out on the loose and uh, all the all the male characters just kind of just kind of pat her on the shoulder like they're there. It's, it's going to be OK. And, you know, a lot of women today are doing the same thing. They're just they're using this media platform to finally get their voice out like, hey, there's some creeps out there. So it just kind of feels uh, I don't know, it just feels like it was, uh, you know, ahead of its time a little bit. It almost feels similar in what's going on today in a lot of things. I think it's interesting. I mean, I, I, the, that book, uh, Carol Clover's book, is kind of I've, I've read passages from it over the years, and I think it's really interesting, and especially seeing uh, her perspective and from a female critic. I think it's it's really important and enlightening because obviously at the time, um, you know, her her book was I don't know when it was. Um, released it was uh, but it was not that long after the, the the slash movie craze so it's a bit of an unpopular like early opinion. 90s 92 uh, 92 yeah so it's kind of unpopular opinion amongst uh, feminists uh, to actually uh, sort of examine that and they kind of role of the final girl and all these things now that we kind of take a little bit for granted but it's the other book i think i was looking at today was uh, blood money which i can't remember the name of the guy who wrote it so forgive me but he um in in that book he looks at the uh the teen slasher cycle and he sort of looks at how um they even back then they were even back in all the way through the film industry back from i was reading a book called the star machine looking at the, how manufactured and and audience tested films were back in the, the heyday of hollywood in the 30s and 1940s so um so saying it's in some ways it's quite cynical the kind of filmmaking process the kind of slash movies of this type that you 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 know as you mentioned me but a lot of the audience were female for these movies so it was writing uh something of kind of female empowerment throughout it but also undercutting it with um uh, female degradation and uh, uh mm-hmm. the kind of sleazier elements of the movie for other parts of the audience and the siskel and ebert uh review when they're talking about how the audience were cheering or uh, laughing at the dead dog now obviously i'm an animal lover and you know I, but the fact is that they 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 didn't understand the kind of the bad taste and um, the humor that obviously when people see horror movies, it's, you know, part of the fun was uh, shouting back at the, at the screen, all those kind of things that were going back and uh, uh, the movies at this time. So it's, it's all make believe. And so when they were laughing at it and having a, you know, shouting back at the screen and sort of trying to give uh, uh, characters on the screen direction and things like that, it's not necessarily, it's not, Siskel but took it all far too seriously, I think. But there's a lot of stuff going on on in these movies, um, and of course it's easier or not easier, but to try and unpick it in retrospect, 
Uh, but uh, yes, I, I think the contemporary reviews are, of the movie were pretty bad, uh, although Siskel and Ebert were actually one, one of some of the few that actually said that the film was actually relatively good, well made. Um, but yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's interesting to look back at it now uh, through fresh eyes because, I mean, we're going back, what, sort of, you know, many decades now since it was made. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, do we want to get into some uh, background on this? Because I know we, time is kind of slightly limited. Um, so, uh, Meep, do you have anything for us as our guest of honour? I, I could probably say the box office stuff, which, you know, you guys will get to. Mm. I will say that I saw this in the theatre, uh, at the Low State Theatre in Times Square, along with The Postman Always Rings Twice, which was also a pretty s- sexual movie. So I got up my eye full in, <laughs> uh, on that uh, spring day in 1981 <laughs> with, these, with these two films. Uh, you would have uh, only been about six. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw everything in the, in the, I know, playing in the theatre. I know, I know you did, but you would have only been six. And these are two... <laughs> X rate, well, whatever the R rated movies. They were very adult. Um, to give you some context, other movies playing at the time were Ford Apache, The Bronx, Eyewitness, which is a pretty good thriller, All Night Long, The Final Conflict, Caligula was playing, uh, Michael Mann's Thief, American Pop, The Howling, Funhouse. Um, also, they just reissued uh, Holy Terror, aka Alice Sweet Alice, at the, around the same time. Uh, the Devil and Max Devlin, Stir Crazy, When Time Began. Tests, Final Exam was also playing at the same time. And the movie that was playing for several months that uh, that I actually ended up enjoying later on was Ordinary People, um, another movie about trauma in a different way. Um, so there were a lot of uh, different kinds of movies playing at the time, and you got definitely had variety at the time, which was pretty great. Uh, another bit of uh, uh, background, I guess, that uh, the actor who plays the phone freak, John DeSanti, he was previously in uh, King Frat from the same director, Ken Wiedenhorn. And King Frat, of course, was basically a quick Animal House ripoff. And uh, John DeSanti uh, played the Belushi role as uh, J.J. Grossout uh, Gombrowski. Uh, so uh, he got to play a killer and he got to play a uh, slob. So um, the, the composer of the film was Richard Einhorn, who worked on Shockwaves. And he also did uh, the score for some uh, some pretty good horror movies. Don't Go in the House, which I think is a pretty great movie around the same time. Uh, it came out in 1980. Uh, the Prowler and Blood Rage. Um, so he had pretty good horror uh, scores there. I love that this movie shares the same editor as Nightmare on Elm Street, Rick Shane. And that he worked on one of my favorites from the late 80s. Lover Boy with Patrick Dempsey. Oh my goodness, I love Lover Boy. Love that film. Um, I don't think I've seen Meep. it. But, mm. Yes. Please tell me that as a six year old, you did not go see Caligula in the cinema. <laughs> hey, actually, Caligula, of that, of that list, I'm looking at it. There's a few on the list I didn't go see. Uh, Caligula was one of the ones I didn't go see, but I did. Uh, we did rent it on VHS when it landed on VHS. And that was. Yeah, when you were about seven. How inappropriate. I'm going Experience. straight to. My grandmother really wanted to watch it. She really wanted to see that. Oh, come on. I watched hardcore porn at seven years old. I think uh, Caligula is going to be nothing. Honestly, I was watching like Slumber Party Massacre and stuff at three or four. Yes, but Caligula has full shots of full full penetration and ejaculation in it. So I guess that's worse than violence. It is. (laughs) In the eyes of the censors, it is. Yes. (laughs) Well, okay. Well, thank you, Meep. Uh, is is that you spent, as it were? Mm-hmm. So, who would like to go next? Uh, Nathan, do you have anything for us? No. No. Okay. Uh, Joseph, how about you? Yeah, actually, I actually have a few things, but Meep read them all, so no. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Eric, how about you? Hey. I've got loads, but you're about to read it all, so no. Oh. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, the one thing, we have mentioned this already, it was written by Ron Curse, who did the screenplay for Friday the 13th Part 2. I think he's he gets a credit on subsequent sequels as uh, based on characters created by, because he sort of created uh, adult okay. Jason, I suppose. Right. Um, so just to say that Ken Wiederhorn, <laughs> um, he had directed Shockwaves, which makes an appearance in this film they're watching on the television, but he went on to make a film that I think I'm the only person who likes, which is Return of the Living Dead Part 2. Uh, he did Dark Tower as well, and he did Meatballs 2 uh, a few years after this. So I love Meatballs Part 2. Okay. okay. 
Am I the only one who likes Return of the Living Dead Part 2? I, I saw like that. I saw that. Okay. I love it was Return awful. of the Living Dead Part 2. Oh, I like through. it too. Mm-hmm. I like so it as well. Good. It's got that classic line where the you know he says to his girlfriend, you know, if you love me, you'll let me eat your brain. And she's like, mm. oh, okay then. <laughs> Justin, what were you saying? Sorry. Uh, I can't remember now. You saw it in the cinema or something, oh, you- was it? Mm, I saw Return of the Living Dead part two in the cinema, and I was yeah, very disappointed so I, yeah. after seeing uh, after seeing Return of the Living Dead on video, and then thinking, "Oh, it's going to be more of the same," and it was a bit sillier. Um, but uh, just a, a couple this, of uh, this is not a cock two movie. I demand <laughs> my money back. I demand my money back, indeed. But um, yeah, Jennifer Jason Lee obviously went on to be in a lot of movies, and she certainly didn't shy away from controversial roles. Um, uh, as we know, going through the years, but um, as I mentioned before, she she dropped out of school. Uh, she was at uh, Pacific Palisades High School just two months, uh, so she could make this uh, movie. Apparently, she promised her mother that she'd still sit an example if she left, and she didn't. And in the Guardian interview with uh, with Jennifer Jason Lee in two thousand and five, um, uh, she says with amused, exp- um, uh, uh, amu- well, being amused, she said it still comes up in family r- rows even now. Um, in Rolling Stone, she was interviewed, uh, and they asked her, what was your best, uh, bad early career movie? And, uh, she's quoted as saying, oh boy, the first movie I did was a real B horror film called Eyes of Stranger, which I'm sure is ungodly bad. Um, and then they said, can you give me a bad line or two that you had to save a straight face? And she said, oh, that's easy. I had no dialogue. I was blind, deaf and dumb because I was raped when I was a little girl. And then towards the end of the movie, there's an attempted rape and I get all my senses back. Mm, not great. Of course, I was so happy because I got to learn Braille. So I forgot that she has she's reading Braille in this, which I thought was funny, wasn't it? Why she would need to learn yeah, to she, read Braille in this. <laughs> So they asked her, say, so, and do you still know it now? And she said, no. So, um, yeah, the film was uh, was um, basically um, a bit of a flop at the box office. Uh, and uh, some of the contemporary reviews sort of said uh, that Lauren Tews wouldn't be swapping the love boat for a big screen career because the film just didn't really uh, sort of, um, didn't sort of make much money. Um Tom Savini, as we mentioned, he was did the special effects, and he uh, he said brought in, and uh, the, in the scene with the, the when the guy gets his head chopped off, the guy in that was a local lounge singer in Florida, who must have been high for a day or two, but because he was a lounge singer and he was able to hold his breath for a long time, which is why he's used. So the head in the fish tank is really the actor uh, with his head poking through the fish tank. And um, apparently he used, I think he said, uh, I think he used, uh, Thomas Savini said in an interview with Fangoria that he used the the shoulders of Mrs. Voorhees in this. Uh, So it was definitely made after Friday the 13th. Um, and he sort of said that they uh, they put him through this fish tank and filled it up, and he was able to hold his hold his breath. But they had uh, an escape plan uh, if he kind of got uh, got stuck. So um, so, and he was talking. He talked a bit about uh, if you look back on some of the old Fangorias about his his work on this and saying it was a bit of a bit of a, a bit of a rush job, um, as we uh, possibly suspected. So. Um, I'm just having a look at some of the other things. Uh, Janet Maslin of the New York Times uh, wasn't very kind about the movie. She called it a cheap, sleazy horror movie. Um, the uh, There was a few uh, ones that did get uh, semi-good reviews. Um, uh, the um, uh, Alan uh, Jenkins in uh, in one of I think it's a local Florida paper said his eyes a stranger is just frightening enough to keep you uh, to help you lose sleep. Um, in the box office magazine, there's a guy, there's a journalist called Jimmy Summers who always hated slasher movies, and I think he must have hated writing because they would have written about loads of them. Uh, and he said that uh, there isn't much style or originality to Eyes of a Stranger, and the only wit involves people making light of Chu, Two's outrage over the series of murders. There's some suspense that occurs while Two's is digging through the killer's apartment, but so what? It's still an unsettling movie that can only be sold the way any of these movies are sold, which is unsettling in itself, and that's by stressing the film's violence. Um, the uh, I found an amusing story uh, in the Fort Lauderdale News, which is an interview with Amy Krug, who plays Lauren Tews as a six-year-old or a young girl. And uh, she said that um, she went for audition for the director, and uh, he, uh, she says that uh, she had flu, uh, and it said she told the director, if you do not give me the part, I'm going to breathe on you. 
so there you go a little tidbit for you um so uh so yeah the the uh the guy whose head gets cut off is tim hawkins uh, say he was a he was a lounge singer in in florida i couldn't find any more information about the uh the woman who was the uh, uh the english woman who uh was a, g- a girlfriend um uh what else is there there's a couple of other bits um uh starburst uh magazine um put out a review which i imagine was by alan jones or it wasn't uh didn't say but um it kind of amusingly said he knows you're alone so don't answer the phone when a stranger calls it could be a psycho it isn't halloween or prom night but wait until dark and the blind terror might begin and then goes on to say all these are more are the roots uh, of the eyes of stranger although the biggest influence of the lot is clearly john carpenter's 1978 tv movie someone is watching me um, which in turn was uh, inspired by Hitchcock's Rear Window. I've also seen uh, Hitchcock's Frenzy uh, mentioned as an inspiration for this movie. Uh, Sheila Benson in LA Times uh, said um, uh, a partial listing of the makers of this artless and disgusting film can be found below. They should be ashamed. So again, this is, you know, it kind of shows uh, uh, what was uh, the kind of the caliber of uh, reviews at the time for these movies and how much they were kind of hated. So, which is why I think it's, you know, so interesting that Carol Glover sort of uh, uh, kind of re looked into these movies and looked through a different lens uh, a little bit uh, further on. So, um, but the one thing I was, the one, the last thing I was going to mention, which the thing I, I, when you asked me what I was going to say, um, Eric, and I forgot, was that uh, I thought it was quite amusing the director. Uh, with shockwaves was on the TV and everyone was watching it in the film pretty much they cut to a character they're all watching it so I thought he, he was having a little <laughs> makes uh, sense though yeah. I gotta say that I'm gonna defend that because back then you had three maybe four channels yeah. and so more than more than likely everyone's watching the same movie like that's on TV yeah no absolutely I said the, the last the last thing I was going to mention actually was I do have um upstairs uh in my box of uh, slash movie memorabilia that I've kept it's a Japanese movie program for Eyes of a Stranger so thinking but even back back then that films like Eyes of a Stranger would get uh kind of uh, you go to um go and see this film and buy a movie program obviously all in Japanese I don't know what you're saying but it's also interesting I've got some lobby cards put out by Warner Brothers and how they sell the movie there's a scene in there which would obviously lobby cars for cinema with Lauren Tews being pinned to the bed by her boyfriend and in the movie I think if even if there's that scene it's kind of playful one but the way it's portrayed in the the lobby card is um, in the context of the movie is very much more of a kind of like a, you know trying to appeal to people to come and see basically the woman from love love boat being raped so I kind of guess I can't think of whatever way they were trying to push it so yeah interesting times 1981 and uh you know, endlessly fascinating, not necessarily good or bad, but, uh, you know, it's very different from uh, today. So, uh, so anything else we want to say on Eyes of a Stranger before we kind of move on to uh, some other things? Not the poster art with the dead woman in the phone booth filled yeah. with flowers. Yes, we were having a discussion about this. Mm. What's that, that got to do with anything? Yeah, it's very eerie, though. It's sorry your party is dead. I mean, maybe playing on the fact that it's like phone calls and dead bodies, just kind of throwing those elements into mm. one little image i think it was just kind of eerie i did think i did sorry one, your party hmm. is dead is that for the person that's on the other line of the phone or for the woman in the picture i'm mean, dead in that picture <laughs> hmm. yeah okay it, it seemed like, like it seemed like that poster was done almost uh because there's another there was another poster which uh for the, for the movie which i've got or I used to have and it uh shows like a scantily clad woman uh in a bikini and uh, there's um uh, someone looking through um uh, binoculars at her uh so it's a little more of a so the but that that painted poster sort of it seemed designed more to appeal to a female audience perhaps mm-hmm. i agree yeah, i think that, yeah. the um i think the phone booth is supposed to be like a coffin and all the flowers surrounding her i think it's supposed to like harken back to when they before they would embalm people they would like they bury them in like mulch or flowers or petals like that so I think that's okay because to back to. Uh, Nathan brought up a good point in that it looks like um, that sort of foam packaging material that you'd get an Amazon package in. <laughs> it does, doesn't like, it? It was like yeah. the yeah. You know, whatever the styrofoam things are. Yeah, yeah you, mm-hmm. if you look closely, it's actually flower petals. Yeah, I mean, that's which would make more better. sense. But, yeah, that's yeah. better than uh, styrofoam. <laughs> yeah, it's better for the environment as well. I'll yeah, think. this is true. I don't like that styrofoam stuff. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Eric Thunberg. Um, so, um, <laughs> how dare you? 
So, uh, yes, well, let's move on because I say I know uh, time is short. So I think we probably know what time it is. Uh, Yes, we do. Time for a chuckle. Um, But uh, obviously we won't get one. But anyway, here we go. (gasps) It's my joke of the week. It's so, so fucking fantastic. What you call a deaf, dumb and blind girl who's running after some French cheese. Jennifer Chasing Brie. Oh. Jennifer Chasen Bree. <laughs> hmm. uh, the response is muted and has left me feeling deflated. Ha <laughs> ha. Funny. I don't think you understood the joke. I got it. I got it. I've got it's one for good. you, Eric. Yeah? Did you hear that Lauren didn't really. She thought she won. But she didn't oh. win because she actually tews. <laughs> no, the you get it? One, two, one, tews. Oh, that was terrible. <laughs> hey, I came up with that off the top of my head. I you think it's never guess. God, my le- my top three to sci-fi fall. horror joke was even better than that. <laughs> oh, I don't remember your top three sci-fi horror joke. Now I'm gonna have to go back mm. and re-listen. Mm. Well, thank you, mm-hmm. Eric, uh, and I do apologize, Meep. You had to listen to that in person, but. Um, <laughs> So, okay, so um, do we? I think we have got some feedback, haven't we? Because we had, if you remember, if you're a keen listener to Hysteria Continues, um, we had Robo Eric on the last episode. Uh, yes. He wasn't actually here, and so uh, it's interesting. I think a few people were fooled, not many, but uh, Joseph did a bang-up uh, editing job. But, uh, yeah, Eric couldn't be here, so he pho- literally phoned in his performance. Yeah, as usual. <laughs> so yeah, I kind of um, wanted to pull from like more old episodes and just kind of really get into it, but uh, I did not have enough time, unfortunately. That's okay. That's okay. Well, I think it's uh, well. Let's see. Uh, who's got some feedback? Not me. No. Not me. No. no. I've got some feedback. Shall I read my feedback then? Okay. I'd well, like to hear your feedback. Okay. Uh, hey guys, big fan of the show, uh, going on seven years now. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on a on it chapter two, which okay, so we've already covered. But uh, the uh, person Chris who writes in says it was filmed along with part one in my hometown. This time around, I was lucky enough to play a paramedic in the background near the beginning. Look out for the guy in the back of the ambulance, way in the background, just as the director uh, director's credits pop up. I wanted to say that I continue to enjoy your output and appreciate your work being done on Patreon. Uh, And that's from Chris uh, um, uh, on, uh, and he wrote also, it took me over 12 minutes before I realized Eric wasn't on the show this week. Bravo. (laughs) Well done. Well, that's a testament to your hard work there. Exactly. (laughs) Do you have uh, any feedback, Joseph? Or do you want to, um, I'll tell you what, actually, if you don't, then of course we uh, we should do a read out uh, the, um, what people had to say about Eyes of the Stranger on the forums on Facebook. Yeah, this is from Facebook. Um, Darren Burroughs says, I feel like this doesn't get the appreciation it deserves. It's pretty much a blueprint of what an 80s slasher should be. It also has some good tension, especially towards the end. Wes Ray says, I dig this one. One of the more interesting hidden slasher gems out there that doesn't get a lot of the attention it deserves. Blew my mind, however, when I realized the killer was the dopey lead in the late 70s raunchy sex comedy King Frat. Chris Moore says it's creepy and suspenseful, and the uncut version is pretty grisly. I hope it gets a decent Blu-ray release soon. Lawrence Adams says this was excellent. Watched it twice in one day. Let's see. uh, Mike Justice says this played endlessly on cable when I was a kid, but I refused to watch it because I always got it mixed up with that boring ass Sean Cunningham movie where Rip Torn locks those girls in the sewer. Jenny Hall Cameron says I need to watch it again. I mostly remember it now, mostly for being a great performance from a young Jennifer Jason Lee. I think if I remember correctly, she is a mute. Uh, Adam Claver says it's passable. Not sleazy enough to be pure slasher fodder, nor respectable enough to be a thriller. Good performances and a head in the fish tank. Six out of ten. Lars Jacobson says, solid thriller with slasher trappings. That really is the essence of 1981. Every pore of this film's body screams 1981. A strong three out of five. 
I don't know. I just felt like it felt 1979 to me. But, you know. Ron Burgundy says, undoubtedly, Dario Argento's last great film. (laughs) 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 Alan Dale. (laughs) Yeah. Alan Dale. Uh, Cockroach Girl. Hair. Hair. Toya Susie, whatever. Oh, how do we get so many memes? Uh, Justin Kosh says, an underrated movie definitely needs a high def release. Matthew Caldwell says, love it and really hope Scream Factory releases it. Ara Alashan says, I love the anchor woman and peril subgenre and found this entry offered a welcome blend of slasher trash and panache. Maybe I should trademark that. James Pacman, James Pacman, <clears throat> not the actual Pacman. James Pacman says, only saw it a few years ago and found it quite entertaining. As an avid watcher of The Love Boat, it was amusing to see your cruise director, Julie, in a stalk and slash film. Well worth a look. David A. says, I really love it. It's been on TCM a couple of times lately, and I really enjoy it. Really dig the Richard Einhorn synth score as well. Paul Downey says, very underrated. Billy Vadreen says, it's a flawed film that doesn't really seem to have the courage of its convictions to either be an exploitation potboiler or a semi-serious television movie. He goes on to say, I really love some of the images used to advertise the movie more than the movie itself. I think the biggest letdown for slasher fans is the MIA Tom Savini effects. Uh, were they missing? I don't know. They were cut um, out They were cut out of most of the prints until it got yeah, uh, released. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I read that wrong. Anyway, he goes on to say, um, uh, which would have really helped me find more to like about this film. Having said all that, Jennifer Jason Lee is fine in her rather thankless role. And the film has a bit of a visiting hours vibe to it that I like. It would actually be a pretty decent second feature in a visiting hours double bill. David William Robinson says, I really have a soft spot for this movie. Neil Lemoy says, it's fantastic. I love it. Andrew Moncrief says, rewatched this last week. I found it really dull this time. Despite being from Georgetown Productions, in fact, it is their follow-up to the original Friday the 13th. It feels very much like a TV suspense film, like John Carpenter, someone watching, someone's watching me, and not a truly cinematic slasher influenced thriller. I'm a big Jennifer Jason Lee fan, but she isn't given much to shine, given much time to shine. So mostly, what I remember is Tom Savini's effects and the fantastic poster art. Uh, Chad Hemsley says, "Remember it being quite a classy one. I, I like my slashers to be a bit more trampy than this." Hashtag Trampy Slashers. Hashtag Y'all's Turn. <laughs> I couldn't really say this is a classy yeah. film, could you? <laughs> I think the cinematography makes it feel mm. classier than it is. But not many movies have a, um, a, a kind of scene with a, a stripper blindfolded, sort of grinding around, sort of <laughs> a leg in the air, do they? No. Um, on Instagram, the squint one says, a pretty meh stalker killer film, in my opinion. Worth checking out, I guess, to see Jennifer Jason Lee in her first movie role. Lou Toad says, from the maker of King Frat. Golan and Globus says, good movie. Dave Felter says, I love it. Pleasingly offbeat and suspenseful. New, uh, okay, I'm not even going to pronounce that. Uh, you just got a long name, okay? Take a plucky TV reporter, hysterical, blind, mute, deafness, head in a fish tank, mix in a schlubby killer with a terrible haircut, and serve tepid. <laughs> Time uh says, love it. Super sleazy and mean spirited, and I, I love having two heroines, especially an older gal too. Slasher Junkie says it needs a Blu-ray release. Adam Quilty, guilty? I don't know. Uh, says his name is Adam A T O M, like you know, boom. The minute building block of life says rear window for the Deuce Denizens equals solid, and a killer had a great role in the Star Chamber. I've never seen the Star Chamber, but I used to have that on VHS. Love that artwork. Uh, Eugene Weaver Nine says very good slasher with an icky killer on Twitter. Boo Brother Brandon, I love that name. Boo Brother Brandon. It was a little slow for me. I thought Jennifer Jason Lee did a fairly good job, though. I'd say it's above average, but not the one I rewatch often. Beauty the Beast and the Bees. I love these names. Oh my god, I need to get on Twitter more often. Uh, Beauty the Beast and the Bees says finally saw this on. TCM recently, not a bad entry in the imperiled newswoman subgenre, but it's kind of slow and Lauren Tews isn't the most magnetic lead. Jennifer Jason Lee impresses in an early role, and the climax is fairly exciting. Steve Yacht says, love it. I've always been a big fan of Queensryche's work in the 80s, and I was going to say, hey, maybe we should play out with uh, Eyes of a Stranger by Queensryche, but probably not. 
Uh, finally, Patrick says, awesome movie, one I return to every now and then. Excellent. Okay, well, we should play out with that. I don't know the song, but it's kind of, uh, I was either that or Betty Davis' eyes. I was thinking. <laughs> but Everyone is ask, a lot of people are asking for a Blu-ray release there, and I think that Jennifer Jason Lee's character would like to watch it in high def. <laughs> I like that one better than your actual joke. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. But I did wonder, I mean, how she, she would have been rubbish at uh, sorting socks, wouldn't she? The character. Yeah. She was doing all the laundry and stuff. But uh, yes. Anyway, so, well, thank you for writing in, everyone. And uh, it was lovely to hear from you. And we'll be announcing uh, what we're covering next time. And uh, it's going to be a doozy. <laughs> Devil Times 5 is the fast-paced podcast in which three comedians and two horror experts dissect a different theme, franchise or subgenre each month before playing around with horror's hardest quiz. <laughs> Scary noises. So, for hot takes and piss takes, listen to Devil Times 5, the British horror podcast that knows how to have fun. full of them. From low budget crap fests to downright unwatchable. And only two men are willing to watch them all. So climb in and take your seat. This is Short Bus Cinema. Let's do it. Hey everyone, this is Johnny Krug from Kruger Nation. And this is Rick Morgan from the Hell Ming Power Hour. Well, we have decided to team up and take you where no one has gone before. We're on a quest to find the world's worst movie, and we're doing it on the bus. Driving through cult classics in every genre to find the holy grail of bad movies. So if you're looking for something different and more fun than you can stand, then climb on in. Short Bus Cinema is a proud member of Legion Podcasts. That's right, yo. Short Bus Cinema. We'd love to watch the movies you hate. i uh, just like to say a huge thank you to Meep. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show, and hopefully it won't be so long next time. So um, you, you've uh, sort of filled us in a little bit about what you're, you've been up to with uh, the podcast, but can you give a hint of what's, what else is coming our way? We're definitely doing ghost movies, and then we might be revisiting a uh, trilogy of sequels that are, let's say, divide fans of a certain horror franchise. That's a big, that'll be coming later this month. If people want to check out uh, the Retro Movie Love podcast, which I very much recommend, uh, where can they find out more information? It's uh, all over the internet. RetroMovieLove.com has all the episodes. We're on uh, Apple Podcasts. We're on uh, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, everywhere. And we even have a Patreon. So uh, just just type in Retro Movie Love on your internet browser and you'll, you'll see us in several spots. So easy to find. And uh, we have a good amount of titles in our back catalog and there'll be more coming. Excellent. OK, well, thank you again. And uh, thank you to everyone listening. And I think it is time now to, well, it's getting to that time of year, isn't it? When uh, the nights draw in and uh, little jack-o'-lanterns being flickering in the distance. So we've run out of all the good Halloween movies, haven't we? <laughs> so, yeah, you know what's coming. Oh, oh it's yeah, I it's love my, this build up. I love this build up. This is great. Well, it's my pick next, but this one has been foisted upon me, um, like Harvey Weinstein. Um, so <laughs> the fans yeah, demanded, Eric. The fans demanded. We're covering Rob Zombie's Halloween. I've already compiled the intro to it, and it's for over 18s only. <sighs> the intro itself so. is there some like potty mouth <laughs> stuff going on in it well it's very difficult to compile a, a 90 second sequence of dialogue from the film without including some potty mouth words mm. yes i haven't watched it i'm i am genuinely interested to see uh, what i think of it because i haven't watched it since uh, i saw it probably 10 years ago so mm. uh yeah it'll be interesting to see what we think so yes yes we'll join us next time on the hysteria continues when we go full zombie ween 
and uh, yeah. we go uh, back to Haddonfield for Trailer Trash Halloween. So uh, not that we mm. n- not saying because who knows it could be a revelation. We could all love the movie, but you'll have to tune in next yes. time to find out. Yes, we could. <laughs> well, so um well we'll play out i'll leave it up to you joseph you've got some uh you've got two choices there of what to play out with so uh but uh, yeah. i'm sure there's a song called with stranger in the title that Susie has done at some stage the song on the valley girl soundtrack called eyes of a stranger by the paolas that's pretty good too okay well you maybe you could do a little melody joseph you haven't got enough to do already medley not melody or med- med- medley i can always get that medley i know medley, always yeah. get that word it's one of those you know you get those words that sort of um can't say properly yeah. like mm-hmm. tonka um so like what nothing um you said okay. something about toya didn't you you horrible man he called her a tonka like a tonka drum a t- oh yeah well tonkas are fun and so is toya hmm <laughs> So, anyway, okay, well, we'll play out whatever we're playing out with and, uh, and yeah, look forward whatever. to... Well, we Who won't knows? look... We not, may not be looking forward to it. We will catch you next time, and it will be fun, I'm sure, wh- whichever way we yeah. go with uh, Rob Zombie's Halloween. So, um, yeah, we'll catch you next time. So say goodbye to the good people. Bye, y'all. Bye forever. Keep pulling on.